I'd like to call the meeting back to order. Um, we're looking for another select person. Please. Oh. oh, there she is. She was in camouflage. Well, we're going to get started without them. <laughs> Article 6, to see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $1,070,275, which includes $1,002,275 from user fees and $68,000 from other revenues to pay the current expenses and debt of the sewer department for fiscal year 2020-2021. What is your pleasure on Article 6? Moved by Roy Bates. Is there a second? Second by Eddie English. Um, questions or comments on Article 6? Oh, yes, Jason. <laughs> Could you just say a little bit about the debt portion of that? What, what, what that debt? It's from? At this point, the, there, is no, there is no debt in that 106. That's for fiscal uh, 21. Um, let me just make sure I'm telling you the truth. We don't anticipate drawing down, uh, there's two pieces to it. The, uh, the engineering piece, um, we envision being funded by a drinking water, um, no interest loan. It has a five year term. Um, and that would be rolled into the bond uh, at a point where we go to construction. The, the bond uh, based on the uh, Based on the timing that we're looking at at this point, uh, we won't be drawing money down until um, probably the very beginning of fiscal 22. Uh, so at this point, uh, there is no, um, in this budget, there is no debt, or no debt service. So can you explain actually what that article is authorizing sure. for lay people? Um, if you look at uh, Article 6 and the little handout we did, I'm just going to follow that. Well, no, I'm not going to follow that. You, <laughs> Article 6 is the operating budget. Um, and the operating budget this year is $106,000 higher uh, for basically um, for basically three reasons. Um, the days of spreading sludge on local fields is over, um, and we will be dewatering, uh, actually creating a cake uh, from the sludge and shipping it to a landfill. That is going to be more expensive than land application, um, and that's the uh, one of the reasons. Uh, the second piece. Uh, we've included in the sewer budget um, an allocation uh, in the capital reserve for uh, um, unreserved co uh, compensation for uh, vacation absences, sick days and absences. And there is a $35,000 allocation in that budget to, um, if we can't find other money, to begin the preliminary engineering on the uh, main wastewater treatment plant. The, the rest of the change basically is uh, just normal operating. Any other questions? Yes, Peter. Uh, my, my question simply is, so once the sludge is removed from the plant, where are we, where are we dumping it? Uh, on whom? Who gets that responsibility? The, uh, 
the current situation, we're, we've hired uh, uh, last uh, August, September, uh, we hired a company from New Hampshire, a company called Senesec. Uh, they bring a portable drying rig in and some uh, open top carriers, open top trailers. It goes to a landfill uh, someplace in New Hampshire where they use it for cover uh, in central New Hampshire. Uh, we have to do uh, we have to do all of the state certifications. Uh, it's all done under the strictest of regulation and rules. Any other questions on Article Six? Yes, Roy. Is there a second? Or, it, you, okay. So we could have, or we could have just voted on it. Um, they, but it's been moved and seconded. So all in favor of closing discussion and voting on Article Six, say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We'll now vote on Article Six um, to see if the town will vote to appropriate. $1,070,275, which includes $1,002,275 from user fees and $68,000 from other revenues to pay the current expenses and debt of the sewer department. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 6 is adopted. Article 7, to see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $900 and pay each of the trustees $300 for the purpose of paying the trustees of public funds for services rendered and approve the expenditure from the income of the trust funds for that purpose. What's your pleasure on Article 7? I'll move Article 7. Moved by Butch Sutherland. Is there a second? second. Jeff Kahn, second. Um, questions or comments on Article 7? <coughs> Seeing none. We will vote on Article 7. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 7 is adopted. <laughs> Article 8. To see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $1,500 for the purpose of having the public trust funds audited and approve the expenditure of $1,500 from income of the trust funds to pay for the annual audit. I move out of the way. Moved by John Doton. Is there a second? Second by Ed English. Any questions or comments on article? Yes, Matt. Uh, I'm Matt Powers. I'm a trustee of public funds for the town of Woodstock. Um, I'm not advocating one way or the other, but I think moving forward, uh, both Jill and myself have done significant work on consolidating funds and cleaning up, um, one which the auditor uh, was, I think, quite pleased with. So moving forward, maybe next year, is seeing those auditing costs go down. Um, it seems relatively high at this point. Um, I think uh, one more review, and then hopefully the town will approve to see that go down. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on Article 8? <coughs> Seeing none, we will now vote on Article 8. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it. Article 8 is adopted. Article 9, to see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $25,000 for general improvements to Vale Field. What is your pleasure on Article 9? I move Article 9. Moved by John Doton. Is there a second? Second. Can't see who that is. Oh, got it. Um, questions? Yes. Ray has some comments. This is um, to uh, increase the funds that we have now to replace the tennis courts. Um, right now, we are at 160,000 put aside. We need about 200,000 to redo the tennis courts. If they'll feel they're public courts, um, and it, we will keep trying to add to this budget and get the money to get the courts so that everyone can use them safely. Jason has a question, then Matt. <laughs> So 
we just heard from Allison Clarkson, is she still here? You know, about the importance the state is placing on families and that we are one of the top kind of states in the country in terms of quality of life. Yet the paradox exists that we don't have the infrastructure to support families here. This, this particular article is a great example when we heard from folks earlier about strategy, an infrastructure strategy. We're 50,000 short of fixing the tennis and basketball courts, which are 40 years old. This is a high leverage item. Our neighboring towns have tennis courts that are functional. My daughter was told not to play on these courts because they're dangerous. Here we have an opportunity to provide an amenity at relatively low cost that appeals to families and frankly everyone in the community and get it done now. It's one of those sexy things. Sewer's not sexy, it's necessary, of course. But here's an example of trying to prioritize infrastructure items that are high leverage with things that are necessary. So I would like to see us fund, fund, fund it now. One of the key points that keeps being made here about macroeconomics in this community is that 80% of our taxes, our, our, our tax bill, comes from the education uh, taxes. Every student, every pupil into this district is worth almost $20,000 in revenue from the state. Every student out that doesn't come is a, a deficit in a sense that we have to make, to make up. So this is again one of those high leverage items. So for sure, uh, you know, this is one, w w I'm just questioning why, why don't we fund the whole thing now? We've been chipping away at it, yet we're putting in $800,000 for other things. This is an example. So could I make an amendment to this article that suggests that we include $50,000, cover the cost of this work uh, for improvements to Vail Field and get them done uh, this year? Is there a second? Second. I'm sorry, who? Oh, okay. So your your amendment would be to add fifty thousand to this? No, add twenty five. Add twenty five. Which would still leave you twenty five thousand short, right? No. No. We have a hundred and sixty we have a hundred and sixty got it. So another fifty would right. be No, 210. So, yeah. um, so the amendment would be to change this to read $50,000 for general improvements to Vail Field. Yes, Barbara, right behind you, Molly. Barbara Triple Simmons, my question is if we do uh, vote this amendment in vote for $50,000 this year instead of just 25000 Would the work be able to be done for this tennis basketball season, 2020? It would have to go out to bid, and we'd have to see, we'd have to get somebody right up the specs, bid it out, and depending on how fast that happens, you know, it, it, it may be this, it may be the spring, it may be summer. It depends on how quickly we can get somebody to draw up specs and, and plans. Yes, Matt. Sorry, I forgot you had a question pending. Uh, Matt Powers, I'm gonna take off my trustee of public funds and Woodstock History Center hats. Um, so I'm just talking from, uh, as a citizen. Um, as long as I've been here, they've been taking that money and squirreling it away every year. Um, I've never really got a good sense of whether, one, these funds have been restricted just for these purposes, um, and could they be used for other uh, initiatives like paving the roads or whatnot? It is for... It, it's been worn specifically for Vail Field, so it is restricted. Okay. Is my understanding. Um, I also never really have gotten a sense of there's been a plan to, if the funds were available, to actually break ground and do that. Uh, my concern is that in Vail Field and that damage occurred through Irene, although it's in a riparian buffer and that's gonna happen 
for as long as those courts and those facilities are going to be there because it's right next to a stream. And with climate change and all these dynamics coming the, uh, down the road, is this the best bang for the buck? I don't disagree with Jason that you know projects like this are very valuable because I use those courts, but I'm, I haven't used them in probably seven years now because they are dangerous. But with what's coming down the pipeline, it doesn't seem like that would be a wise investment in our future when we're going to have to fix them, just like the town hall and all these other infrastructures. It's going to come down 30 years down the road, or maybe in five years when that river floods again. Um, and can we continue to keep affording to throw money or squirreling money away or making amendments to just increase funds to have it happen when I don't have a real sense that that property is in the right place. Um, I, I'm a, I have an awareness of that property because I have a benefit of seeing the history and how when it was given. And I'll tell you back in the time when it was given, it was an unusable property. It was a cornfield and a cow field. It was never, um, it, you couldn't build on it. Um, that's why Vale gave it. We, I do love the fact that he gave it to the town, but generally when people give property like that, or they give it for the buck, or they give it for free, it's because they can't do anything with it. And they couldn't put houses there, and they couldn't build a road or a bridge. So here we are, 100 years later, trying to put things on a place that had never should have gone there in the first place. And I think this is a moment of pause before we say, oh, let's just keep throwing money at that because it generally seems like that's what we keep doing and then finding ourselves back to where we started. Right behind you, Molly. Um, can somebody just explain where the additional monies that you have already in the budget that, that this 50,000 would then complete the budget, where did, that, where did those monies come from? So every year um, we voted to put 25,000 into this fund and those monies are kept in the capital reserve account. It's part of the four million that Seth was talking about this morning. So that money is in the bank. So uh, just to your point, can I suggest that before we go ahead and initiate this project, we make sure that it's being built in the best place, that if those funds are available for building or refreshing tennis courts, that that be done in a place that we know that they're sustainable over time. Um, and that money is designated for Vale Field specifically. Th that's the way the articles have been worn for the past 10 years. The Seth? But, but could it? I mean, I, I'm not taking a position on this, but uh, to Matt's point, if, if the town decided to take a pause on this, couldn't a, a town vote uh, reestablish where those funds go. I don't know what the statutory authority says. Whether you, I, th I think I it would so. require believe, a town. I, I believe a warned. So I, I just want to make the point that they're not locked yeah. away forever. No, 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 no. But options. you can't just. You can't just. It would, it would require. Can't just. It would require being on the ballot at either at a, the, a, a special, special meeting, meeting or the next meeting. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Either a special town meeting or next year's town meeting. You'd have to warn an article and, and have it changed. Joel has a question. Roy, then Joel. Can you hold the mic in that select board and before? Uh, my uh, great great uncle donated that field to the children of Woodstock. Okay? And the reason he did that, the real reason, Woodstock was planning to build housing up there at that time, and they had no idea what a floodplain or a floodway was. So he decided to give it to the town and and he didn't want to build the road to have this development. The other thing is, that money, I think I had a lot of responsibility of getting it started as a capital reserve. And I think it should remain there because flooding on Vail Field would use most of that money. And uh, if we don't build a tennis court, it doesn't bother me at all if it goes somewhere else. But I think that money should stay there as a contingency against the flood. Irene did half that damage on it, so at the end of that story. I recommend we uh, approve the motion on the uh, Joel has a question on the committee. Yeah, Joel Carey. Um, I figured I'd speak on that since the rec center manages Vail Field. Um, I'll attest that I really did not cause that damage to the tennis courts. Um, 
it didn't make it better, but that damage was there. That was done over years. Um, also, <clears throat> uh, Vail is not an unusable space. Um, I've seen the number of, number of uh, community members, children. I mean, they've, they've put a nice rink down there during the winter times the last few years. It's an extremely popular and used place for this community, so I would hate to see that money go towards something else. Those courts really do need to get redone. Um, I think with the right planning, uh, the right engineers, they could possibly make it so, you know, they wouldn't be less susceptible to flooding that was down there. But there's been plenty of times where that it flooded over those courts, and really all we've had to do is go down and wash them off. So I don't, I don't think that what has happened, even with the extreme of Irene, isn't causing as much damage as, as you may think. Um, so just to clarify that. Thanks. Kareem had a question just to your other side, Hudson. Thank you. Um, kind of in the same vein uh, as what I was talking about earlier, which is can we look at places to save money, et cetera. Um, and I know it might be too late for this process because we're really embarked on it and we've got to move things forward. But when we propose to increase something by 25K, like we're doing it here, I think automatically we need to think where else can we reduce by 25K? Um, because otherwise, I know the amount is, is small, but to me it's more an attitude towards the way money is spent, and that's, that's the point I wanted to make. Um, but I understand it's a, it's a small amount. We are here today, and we're looking to move forward. So I'm not saying let's stop the process for that, but if we could just keep that in mind for future type of discussions. And I know there are projects, big projects in place, because I've heard at some of the meetings looking to save money, and, and if we could just keep doing that, looking at ways to, you know, creative ways to enhance revenues, et cetera, um, th then um, just asking for a change in attitude a little bit, that's, uh, that's all. Thank you. And, and I will say, I, I don't have a legal opinion. I do question whether we are allowed to change an article, to amend an article so that it um, doesn't represent what was warned. You know, we're, we're doubling what was warned on the, on the Town warning. So, what's that? You can increase it. I know that you can increase it. But can you to a degree that it no longer resembles what was warned? I, I think you probably can, but you. <laughs> what's that? We doubled the moderator. We doubled the moderator. Um. But that was a small piece of the article. <laughs> you didn't double what was warned. <laughs> I'm just saying that's one of the things that, that Vermont law is a little. The, the, the idea is you can't say um, we want to spend 10000 to to fix up the school and then you come in and change it to 100000 because that has a, a tremendous impact on people who weren't at the meeting. So I, I'm not, I, I don't know the answer. I'm just saying that it could be problematic if somebody had an issue with it. Yes, Joe. So, so as, as I understand it, the money is already there, isn't it correct? Yeah, it's the money. I, even the additional $25,000 is there. No, no it's, it's, it's not warned. There. It's a warned article that, that we're talking, we're talking about the amendment. <laughs> right, right. right. So, in, the answer to the question, where would that 25, additional $25,000 come from is what? Taxes. Taxes. It'd be tax. an, extra, an extra tax on you. So right now we have 160,000. Okay. We have an engineer's report that says the work can be done for 210,000. Okay. So if we want to, if we vote for 25,000, we have to wait another yeah. year to get it done. If we do 50,000 today, we okay. can get the work done this summer. Okay. So, so I'm, not, I'm not an advocate of, you know, spending more money ever, but <laughs> That's unsolicited testimony. So, but there are a number of people in town and committees and EDC in, in particular are looking, always looking for ways of um, making Woodstock attractive to new residents. It seems to me for $25,000. This kind of falls in the vein of better education, better amenities, better, just a better environment 
for people to find a place to live. I, th I think I can handle that. That's just my opinion. Yes, Susie, and then Matt. Right over behind you, Molly. Down. It seems to me that costs go up every year. So it's $210,000 now, but it's not we keep waiting to you know, raise the money, then it could be $240,000. Which is along the same bent uh, is when was that engineer report made with that quote? Just two years ago, and so <laughs> you don't anticipate any additional costs because of it's two years old. I, I've seen a lot of contractors come in and they usually stay about a year. Um, and in this time with the economy, I don't know if that'll change. But um, if you're thinking that that price is going to stay the same. Yeah. Jennifer? So I think it's a good point to look at uh, how old the engineering report is and how much it's going to cost. I will say that as a resident, a longtime resident of Woodstock, I've been advocating for us to have a tennis court there for many years. My daughter and I both play tennis, but you, you can't play on that court as it is. Uh, last year, Molly joined the tennis team at Woodstock High School, and the, the tennis team at the high school currently is supported by the um, by the Woodstock Inn and the Sports Center. And Molly was on the JV team and they had no courts to practice on because the Inn could not give them enough court space uh, to allow them to practice. So um, sort of an ad hoc year for her in, in terms of trying to actually play tennis in this town. Um, I agree with Kareem that if we're going to be increasing expenditures here, we should find a place to cut them and just be fiscally responsible if there's a way to do that without harming another program. Move the question. Yeah. Is that, can we um, move the question? You can if somebody seconds it. Second. I want to say something. Well, it's been moved and seconded to, to move the question. Um, so we have to vote on whether. On the amendment? On the amendment. We're voting on the amendment to, to increase this by $25,000. Uh, I can't discuss it anymore. Uh, well, we have to vote whether, whether to move the question. So all those in favor of closing discussion and voting on the amendment say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay? Nay. nay. Uh, the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. So we will vote on the amendment to increase this from twenty-five to 50000 All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay? Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Call for division, please. What's that? Can we divide the vote? A, a call for a division of the House? Sure. So I would ask those who are in favor to please stand and be counted. So the motion is amended to now read $50,000. We can continue to, to discuss that at this point. Um, to, yes? The engineering report was done, I believe, in the fall of 2018. So Mary said the engineering report was done in the fall of 2018. For those interested. Yes, Roy. And that's only an engineer's report. It's not a cost. It's, it's not an estimate. It's, it's an engineering report. 
Let me give you a little history out there. In 1972, I believe it was. Uh, well, well, keep the microphone close to you. Okay. There was a uh, committee called the Balefield Committee, and that was taken out a few years ago. But anyway, the Balefield Committee lent a federal grant to reboot Balefield. And the feds would not let them do it unless they stripped the field of 18 inches of topsoil. And that was for the purpose of uh, making it below the housing on Maple Street and some of Gulf Avenue. So that was done. And uh, then, and also in that grant, the grandstand was torn down. And then the bandstand was damaged, I think, by the 73 or 74 flood. So that had to be removed. Now, the reason for the tennis courts, that was built at that time. But they didn't take any care in the subgrade beneath it. They only put a couple feet of gravel in there. And they should have put four feet, and we wouldn't have that problem today. It would be OK. But uh, I think the real big question is, and I'm for everything for real field, I think we should do a, a survey to see how much that is used by Woodstock residents before we don't just keep that money as a contingency fund. Uh, Joel and then Jason. So I guess I can uh, talk a little more on the use at Vail. Um, it also gets used by the Woodstock Union High School Middle School. And I guess it must have been about four years back, maybe, the, the uh, middle school baseball team was housed there every day. That's where they had practice. Um, and it looks to me like it's probably going to go back that direction here pretty soon. Um, so, you know, outside of the community members, which I see more and more of, actually, uh, in guests utilize that just as much as anybody else. Not that, you know, we're here for them, but to some extent, this town runs, you know, on tourism. And the last thing is, you know, um, those tennis courts, if those got redone, um, like Jennifer said, the high school would use them as actually practice places to go because they compete with time at the racket fitness club and they usually get the short end of the stick. So I, I think we need to think outside of just people who live in town that are using it, but also school teams, um, lacrosse teams in the summertime, we have club teams that are out there that, that battle for space. We have men's pickup soccer, um, and I know Charlie can attest they're down there all the time, and actually I've limited their time because other people want to use it. So I think that you would find that it gets used a lot, and it would probably double in the usage if those courts got fixed, if the basketball court got fixed. Um, and with the right engineer down there potentially laying those courts out differently and gaining another court, um, which is actually a possibility. Um, you know, I, I just think that it, it, it's, a, it's an asset in this town that gets overlooked by a lot of people, so. Okay, so my point really wasn't about spending more money. <laughs> my point again was about strategy and thinking about Revenue and expenses. There are two sides to the equation. Okay. High leverage, right? The incentive for you to pay wise come foolish. You're making an investment. We just heard Joel say, talk about incremental usage. If spending another $25,000 was going to get the tennis and basketball courts done that provides an amenity for this community, and one family with three kids either stays here or moves here, each of those kids is worth $20,000 to our district. You've just paid for the tennis court and then some. Okay, so you gotta think about it in a much bigger picture perspective. You just in increase usage for men's leagues, rec leagues, the JV tennis, who might even pay a fee, you know, they might be able to do something there. You have to think about revenue and amenities, high leverage. There are big ticket items that we're gonna vote on that have no leverage. Pure expense, hundreds of thousands of dollars, no upside. You have to be looking at revenue potential and strategy. We just heard from the state that they're putting a, a premium on attracting families. I think it's in our town plan. 
we need to attract families. What I want to see as a taxpayer is some priority. Not maybe we can get it done in the fall. Yeah, let's get it done for the season because we understand the leverage attendant to that relatively minor investment against the grand scale of scope of other investments we're facing. You have to look at revenue and upside, not just expenses, because you can't cut your way to growth. Whether you're running a dentist office or a gas station or a school or a town, you can never cut your way to growth. It has to be investment. Uh, right here, Jennifer, and then over to you, Matt. Uh, uh, Molly, I mean, right here. Mr. Nixa. Thank you, Dave Nixa. So, um, I actually support this, but I voted against it. And my primary reason is process. So what I heard you say was that you don't know if it's appropriate to allow an amendment to a warned article. No, no, it's appropriate to, to amend the articles and amend the, the dollar figures. You just have to be careful that they still represent what was warned in fairness to the people who are not here. Okay, that wasn't clear. I'm sorry about that. So it sounded like there could then potentially be a legal challenge to the modification it, to the warrant. From, from the, those who weren't represented because they didn't show up because right. they didn't. Right. So I'm just saying that having been involved in um, mm -hmm. municipal legal challenges in the past, right. that's just something you need to be clear about. Thank you. Right. Uh, Matt, and then right here. So I just want to clarify, um, I'm actually a tennis player and I used to teach, and I started my career as a parks and recreation person. So I'm a huge advocate <coughs> of what you're talking about, Joel. I, I'm all for that. Well, I am, uh, and I voted for, actually, the amendment. Um, what I'm just concerned with is, um, as Mary, maybe you can clarify, Mary, you said the, there was an engineer report from 2018, but there was no cost estimate. And going to Jason's point, yes, we should be investing. I'm just, I'm not sure what that number is. I don't know where that number came from and where, and perhaps it was in some discussion along the way. Yeah, we, did a, we did a site visit at Bale Field. No, I'm think not sure that's We had a site visit at Bale Field, and I believe it was mid to late September of 2018. Following, following that, the engineer that was with us submitted a, a plan. And at that time, he said it would probably be about $210,000 based on information he had at that time. This was not a cost estimate to do it. And we have not proposed any bidding for it because we needed to get the rest of the money together and closer to when we thought we would do that which was another two years we would of course started looking for a, a sincere proposal for that because exactly as you stated or someone did something that cost two hundred thousand dollars this year in three or four years it could be 250 and we know that so we don't have a formal proposal to do the work. <coughs> um, I haven't heard yet whether the new court or the refurbished court could be made resistant to Irene. I think that's the big question here. If it can be, then it's a good proposal for the money. But if the next Irene is just going <coughs> to destroy it, it's throwing good money after her. Jennifer? I can tell you that the courts were in really rough shape before Irene, and having tried to play there for years, they don't look a whole lot different than they did before Irene. I would make a suggestion that if we're going to be spending money to build new courts, perhaps they could be moved slightly further away from the bank of the river and towards the road. That's, that to me makes sense. Well, what, years, when I was on the rec board, we, we discussed <laughs> this, and one of the discussions was to build them properly the next time. As Roy stated, they, they weren't they, they weren't built properly to begin with. So I, I would expect that's probably what an engineer looked at. It, quite, it, there's been a motion to move the question and a second. All those in favor of closing discussion and voting on the article say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. 
We'll now vote on Article 9 as amended to see if the town will vote to appropriate the sum of $50,000 for general improvements to Vale Field. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 9 as amended is adopted. Article 10. Shall the town of Woodstock vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $150,000 for the purpose of paving the town and village roads? What is your pleasure on Article 10? Moved by Ed, second by John Doton. Yes, Jill has a comment first. So I'm going to introduce this article, and we're just talking about the paved roads in Woodstock. We have about 40 miles of them. And many of them are in very poor condition. So we're all very familiar with Route 4 coming through the village and Route 12 and 106. The state is scheduled to repair those in the summer of 2021. So I'm not going to talk about those. This proposal is to increase the amount of money that we put towards our roads this year and maybe every year. So what we do right now with our roads is fill potholes and then put a very small skim surface on top. And we keep doing that year after year after year, sometimes on some roads. And eventually we're going to have to rebuild our roads. But the kind of money that we put away to do this work is totally insufficient to do that. So in the past years we've spent 60,000, um, getting as high as 90,000. What we've done this year is to, is to put in the budget that you've approved $26,000, which will give us enough to patch Route 4 until the state does that road, and it will be a match on the Pleasant Street work that will be done by the state, for which we have a grant. And now we're saying to you, do we want to spend 150000 repaving some of our roads and Maybe, if we keep this going, do we want to spend more of our money on our roads so that we have decent roads in the village to drive on? And we avoid all of those complaints about people wrecking their tires on our roads, but we spend the money, we put the money aside that's needed to really build this part of our infrastructure. So the 150,000 is the start of this, and that, the impact of that would be $34 for a house that's valued at 200,000 or 68,000 for a house valued at 400,000. So that's the difference it would make in your tax bill to put 150,000 towards uh, resurfacing our roads. Yes, Joe, and then Seth. Or why don't we go with Seth first since he's gonna get the microphone sooner. Thank you. Um, one question, I guess, I, guess um, I understand why this is separate from the budget. Uh, my question is, because there's no listing of what is in the restricted funds, I, I, I would think that there would be money in a restricted fund to pay for this, and, and I'm assuming the answer is no. And, but the, I think this is just another point to point out, we need to be able to see what is you know, uh, already committed and, and what we have in balance. So um, there is no money put aside for roads. I, I, th I believe we spent anything that was there last year. Joe? Thank you. Uh, I remember having a conversation, I think, he, uh, with Phil about this specific issue uh, with regards to Route 4. Um, and I think he even mentioned it because I asked him that question at a previous town meeting. And I think what he said, and correct me if I'm wrong, the state comes in, looks at the condition of the road, and if it's not as bad as they anticipated it was, they just move back the date of when they'll come in and do it over again. And if we keep patching it up now to a usable condition, they just keep moving the date back. I'm wondering if that is the case, if somebody come up there and say, yes, Phil's right about that. Because I said in response to what he said, what do you mean, if we leave this place, a mess, they'll come in quicker. And he said yes. So I'm asking that question. If we spend money repairing these roads, does the possibility exist that the state will come in and say, well, it's not so bad. Let's move it back another year. 
So that is what Phil used to say, for sure. But this proposal is not to do work on Route 4 or Route 12 or 106, but our minor roads. Great, great. Thank you. Yes. You so I understand what you said correctly, Joe. This is inside <coughs> money for roads other than 4, 6, and 12, yeah. 106 and 12. But is there a plan of which roads will be done and when they'll be done? And, and it sounds like this is going to be a recurring thing over time so that eventually all of the non-highway roads then become repaired and or replaced. But is there a plan for how that's going to work? So the highway department always have a plan of the most urgent roads to do. And um, the plan would be to work through those roads in terms of urgency. And has that plan been published? Is there an... So uh, I have a list of them now. Okay. Do you want to hear them? Yes. Okay. Uh, College Hill, both ends, Eaton Place, Stanton Street, Ford Street, Lincoln Street, Rose Hill. That would be the first one. Not High Street, which is a pothole heaven. <laughs> well, and we could add to that, right? River Street, High Street, there's potholes everywhere. Uh, Ed, did you have a question or no? Uh, Roy does, I guess. Uh, yes, I had a, a question. What are we going to, are you going to uh, dig down and get a base for these, uh, what, these uh, patches? And if so, then the state will say, sure, that particular spot does not need repaving. So with this money, we are not going to do Route 4, Route 12, or 106. The state will come in and they will do exactly the work you're talking about, and they will, um, they will dig down, they will do three inches surface on those. We're talking about money to be spent on the minor roads, which the state will not do for us. Right. And, and the question about whether to resurface it or rebuild it is a long-term strategic decision that we also have to make. Um, there have been estimates that you should have 100,000, it will cost you $100,000 per mile of road to do. If you say that we have 40 miles of road, you could be saying that we should have $400,000 spent on our roads every year. We're not approaching that yet, so we're probably back in the fill the potholes and skim it. Roy, and then David had a question down here. Uh, I have to speak against this motion. Uh, if it said, uh, the article said, proposed infrastructure uh, fixing of our dirt roads, then I would say, yes, let's go for it. But uh, we have 1.9 million in our highway budget already. I think we need to take a, a better look at a larger plan before we approve something like this. Thank you. David, you had a question? It's coming. I want to talk about that gorilla, which is Route 106, 12, and 4. It wasn't that long ago they came through and did it. So they're not going to do it every three or four years. When are we going to actually fix our roads? Do you, do you mean Route 4 and 106 and 12? It's not just Route 4, 106, and 12. It's almost every road in our, right. our district needs to be really made, you know. I've got potholes. You guys have heard me. Well, probably you haven't. I quit talking about potholes <laughs> a few years ago, and I gave Jay Morgan an epic poem that I wrote about them. And the fact of the matter is that I went out and measured potholes and, and crowns in roads and all sorts of things. And I have potholes near my house that have been there since I was a child and I'm 76 years old. So the, the real question is to all of us, not really to you, are we going to fix our roads or are we just going to, 
Well, I can't use that word here. Um, uh, are we just going to continue to mess around with them? It's a good question, and it's one that perhaps we need to have like a 10-year plan, and we do a certain number of roads every year, and we keep, and then we, the next year we do the next roads, and you have a cycle of 10 years so that you approach every year, every road in 10 years, just like we would like to do on our sidewalks. Yes, Sally. Um, when the roads are done like College Hill, redone again, are they going to limit uh, the weight on them? Logging trucks come down that road, and that's what's doing the damage is the heavy, heavy equipment and trucks coming down the roads. They can only come down the road with an overweight truck permit, right? Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the town gets money back from the states for, for our roads, a certain, what do they call that? The reimbursement. The rebate and state aid and they pay us back for some of our, for all of our roads. And if we restrict a lot of those roads, we don't get the state aid. And that's a significant amount of money for our roads. Um, and that's where we get some of the money to do the work that we do. So the truck damages it, yeah, we just run along behind with a, a buggy and fix it after that, because they gave us the money. It's not a good plan, I agree. Yes, Laird. And was there somebody up here? Oh, okay. sorry. Well, I just have a brief comment. You've got a, uh, a state rebate for uh, the roads that we have here that we allow basically on limited transportation to cross. As I sit and kind of watch new and new, new and greater uh, loads of traffic moving down River Street. We had subsistence along the river last year where it dropped off <clears throat> in some places over 10 inches. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, rebate is adequate to uh, kind of offset that. Plus the fact that with the advent of things like MapQuest and other routing devices, um, people are kind of following the shortest distance through town. And it's kind of like the gumball rally every day uh, with people moving in and out and through these uh, residential neighborhoods, oftentimes at highly inappropriate rates of speed. So you may want to think about some of those limitations to try and provide a little bit more safety and a little bit more longevity to our roads. Yes. So this is really more of a process question because I don't think anybody's going to disagree that we need to fix roads and that's part of the responsibility of the town government. Um, this is being voted on as a special article. Um, what happens if you ask for it next year and it's turned down? Is any of the money that's allocated this year get wasted? And as an additional comment to that, maybe, as you were saying, Jill, maybe we should come up with a 10-year a plan or a cycle or whatever and make sure that people see each time you ask for this special article that it's part of a process that this year we're going to do this, next year we're going to do that, next year we're going to do that, so that there's more incentive for people to approve this. So we have had a bit of a discussion about um, what happens with special articles and, and then bringing them into the regular budget. And one thought is that if everybody votes to, for something, then maybe we could put it in the regular budget and we wouldn't need to vote on it separately. So we're doing it this way this year to find out where people's preferences are. But an example of that one would be if we are to vote the full-time ambulance crew, um, then that's an amount of money that we would probably put in the budget every year because you're hiring people, so it's not going to be on a one-year basis. Roy? Yeah, why don't you come back with that another year? In the meantime, let's t I make the motion, we table this motion and go on from there. Is there a second? I'll second that. Your second a motion to table this? All right. Um, I don't remember if that's debatable. <laughs> I don't believe so. Um, so the, the motion on the floor is to table this motion, which means that we would not vote on it at this point. Um, and it's, I believe, non-debatable. So all those in favor of tabling the motion, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. The nays, 
appear to have it, the nays do have it. Um, we will continue. Um, if there's no further discussion, we can vote on Article 10. Uh, yes, Jason. I had a question about road striping. It's not really, really related to this. But who is the state responsible for the striping and all the crosswalks and all that stuff? So, no. No. Short answer is no. Who, so who, who is? The town. Town. That's in the, that's in the highway budget. And is that, um, that's in the highway budget. Will it be done this year? Re, re striving the crosswalks and all that good We're stuff? We're waiting for the repaving to be done, I believe, to do a major part of it. So we won't? Let me just make sure I process this. No, one. I wouldn't say we won't, but we, the ones in the village will do, but there's some we may not do. The, the more hazardous ones, or the more used ones, I should say. And is there a DOT requirement that we do it at some frequency? Is there a, a liability per the state? I hate to disagree with the chair, uh, since it's been so complimentary about my... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we need to stripe the uh, crosswalks uh, in the spring, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, when they come through, that's almost an annual event. I'm not saying they won't be striped, but there's a lot of them that need major repairs that we're not going to do. And that's in the budget we voted on already? Yes. Yes. Let, okay. Let's stick to this article, though. Any other questions or comments on Article 10? Seeing none. Oh, sorry. Um, my question is regarding how, exactly how many, do we have an idea of how many rows $150,000 dollars will repair? You know, like how, do we have an estimate just as a form of reference for, of that list you, you listed out, how many of them can we get, expect to be fixed with that much money? The list that Jill read would be the priority list. Um, depending upon the, the, uh, the amount of work that we have to do and the price of asphalt this summer, um, the estimate is about a hundred thousand dollars a mile. Um, so that's kind of what we're working with. We might be able to get a mile and a quarter out of this uh, 150, but it all depends on pricing uh, when we uh, when we go out to bid for uh, uh, for for paving this summer. And most of those roads mentioned are fairly short. Yeah. Uh, the the roads that were mentioned, I think, are just a, about a mile and a quarter. Yeah. Any other? Yes, Joel. Yeah. So I guess I just need a little clarification on 150. Is that going towards actually fixing the infrastructure of these poor roads, or is it just to cover potholes and band-aids and... It's it just to resurface, get them drivable, and then wait until they crack out next year, and then we vote on another 150 to just band-aid them again. Yep. So this has nothing to do this with... This particular budget would be a shim and top. Okay. So this isn't looking down the road, trying to, you know, okay. No, I mean, the difficult thing, and I, David might want to speak to this, the, most of the roads in any small town, um, we're simply, we simply blacktop over the old dirt roads, and in some cases, uh, all the way back to corduroy roads. Um, there's very, very few, only maybe in the newer neighborhoods, where the roads are, are properly put in in the first place. Uh, anybody with any road construction, I'm sure, will probably agree with that. So shim and top is about all you're going to get, and you're going to get five or eight or ten years out of a shim and top. Byron, did you have a question? All the way in the back, Hudson. Comment. Prosper Road was going to be the next road paved in Woodstock in 1943. It's still a gravel road. I built my house in 75, and my driveway was level with the town highway at that point. They put enough spot gravel in, so the roadway now is about a foot above my driveway. And you still got tremendous potholes in front of my driveway. So if the road isn't constructed properly to start with, 
You're just throwing good money after bad. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on Article 10? Seeing none, yell if I missed you. Um, we'll now vote on Article 10. Shall the town of Woodstock vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $150,000 for the purpose of paving the town and village roads? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. <laughs> Article 10 is adopted. Article 11, shall the town of Woodstock raise $37,000 for a regional energy coordinator? What is your pleasure on Article 11? I move the article. Moved by John Doton. Second by Susie. Um, Jill? So, we think that we need a regional, uh, we think we need an energy coordinator in this town. Um, but we think we can't afford a full-time person. So the proposal is to join together with six other towns and employ a regional energy coordinator. That will help us reduce our annual energy use and costs, use more renewable energy, and reduce greenhouse gases. We think that this person is capable of working across several towns because many of the initiatives will be the same in the different towns. We've done a lot of energy work in this town already, and most of it's been done by volunteers, and now we believe we're getting to the level where we need some professional help. So that's the logic behind this proposal. Um, we, we are, the proposal is that um, our regional planning commission hires this person, and then we help manage this person by having a a committee of people from, one person from each of the different towns, so that we can direct this person's work. The way we've divided up the um, person's salary benefits and some overhead for Twin Rivers is on, um, is based on the e equalized education taxes. So that if you own a house for 250,000 in Thetford, you pay exactly the same contribution to this person as if you had a house worth 250,000 in this town. So that's the way that the, the monies are divided. Um, the, this is an experiment. So this is um, a one-year proposal where we would look to hire this person, see what they do, see if they've satisfied um, all of the requirements that we have and see if we can do it again next year. But it's an, it's an experiment and it's a way of us looking to employ experts without paying for a full-time individual ourselves. Yes, uh, then we'll go to you, Joe, we'll start over here. Yep, Susie. So when we talked about it in the select board, one of the things the guy said he was also going to be looking at is transportation issues because there's a lot of people who can't get back and forth. And in that conversation, someone said that when they go to the doctor, they call an ambulance to take them to Dartmouth. And this is one of those, and then in that same meeting, we voted to, to uh, just write off the debt for $26,000 worth of ambulance costs for people who didn't pay. So it's bigger than just energy, it's also part transportation, which I think is really important. Uh, I think Joe had a question, we'll get back to you, Rich. <laughs> is each of the same six towns going to chip in thirty-seven thousand dollars? No. Uops. Uh, no. Each town is contributing a different amount um, based on the uh, grand list of that town. So, in the handout that you had, it's identified how much each town contributes. On page nine of that. Um. And then, uh, where, uh, Rich had a question. You can go right here first, and then we'll go to you, Rich. Okay. Uh, yes. My name is Linda Smitty. Uh, my question is, did you explore, or did the group explore, getting a grant, since this is viewed as a temporary position or a trial position for one year? And so that it would be clear that if we had a one-year grant, the money would run out, we would have data to examine the work 
uh, the person before the person <coughs> and hire someone. It's much easier to uh, hire someone for a specified time on soft money than it is to bring on another employee with benefits and then be faced with letting them go if the data doesn't work out. Uh, we didn't explore finding a grant for this uh, position, but we will only offer it as a one-year contract job. We will not take on an employee. So it's not a long-term thing that we're going to tie ourselves into. Is there a commitment to do fo a follow-on study of the uh, extent to which this job actually saved energy, advanced transportation, et cetera? I think it has to be, Linda, because we have to come back to you next year and ask for more money if we want to do it again. Um, Rich? Yeah, I, I think my question kind of piggybacks on what she was just saying. Do we have like clear, clearly defined metrics of what success is when the year is done? Did we, did we get what we paid for, and how will we know it when, when it's happened? So we're using as our model, um, Hartford is a place that is a town that has a, an energy coordinator and we're using them as a model. Um, so they have shown uh, numbers that show their energy savings in the year. They also received several grants, so they actually paid for that person through grant money received. So if we use them as our model, I think that will help us. Yes. And then I'll get to you, Jeffrey. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Cudillo from Sustainable Wichita. So I'd like to, uh, if you give me a few minutes, to present a little bit of a sort of a historic background to go with this kind of a proposal. I just have to put my glasses on here. So this, I think, goes to the conversations that everyone has been having about long-term strategizing. Um, so Wichita, historically has been known for environmental stewardship because of George Perkins Marsh. We have the National Park here and George Bill and Frederick Billings. Um, in 1847, Marsh spoke about climate change and its impacts on the world. And in the 175 years since that speech, not much has been done about climate change, so we're now putting 40 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Every decision residents make as individuals and as a town either decrease or increase carbon emissions or bring us, which if we re increase them brings us closer to the point of no return on the advancement of climate change and we're rapidly approaching that as many of you know. So we cannot really rely, especially right now, on our national government to address these. So we're here at the local level and regional level trying to deal with the solutions having to do with major energy decisions. So in partnership with the town, members of the community and many organizations, the Energy Committee has been working on energy issues in the town of Woodstock for a number of years now, including the town's comprehensive energy plan, which was adopted in July of 2019. So this gets into how this particular proposal for regional energy coordinator fits in with the policies that have already been adapted by the town. In the regional and the comprehensive energy plan, Reducing total energy consumption per capita by more than one a third by 2050 is one of the goals for Woodstock. Meeting 90% of Woodstock's remaining energy needs from renewable sources by 2050 is also one of the goals. Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions are now 16% higher than they were in 1990 when the state had a plan in place to reduce emissions. So instead of going down, we're going up. The three main reasons for that are transportation, residential energy use because many of our houses are old or inefficiently weatherized and, that, um, and we are using more energy than we could be if we were really uh, getting them as tight as we could and using efficient energy systems like our old heating systems. And industrial use was the third. And when it comes to energy, really no town is an island. By sharing the position of regional energy coordinator with six other towns, and those towns are Barnard, Norwich, Pomfret, Sharon, Stratford, and Thetford. Woodstock can gain affordable energy coordination services and the benefits of shared town experiences, regional solutions, and collaborative purchasing and grant submissions. So that is a really 
important piece of this is that it gives us bigger leverage for grants as well. The energy coordinator will help each town reduce annual, annual energy use and costs, increase the use of renewable energies, and reduce greenhouse gases. Woodstock now spends, I believe, somewhere around $200,000 annually on propane and gas and heating fuels. Does that sound accurate? I think I picked that up from one of the town reports. So we're talking about a lot of uses of, and cost. So this particular position would help to reduce that over time. Um, Hartford's energy coordinator, Jeff Martin, who's also on the board of Sustainable Woodstock, over a two-year period between um, fiscal year 2018 and 19, has achieved one-off savings and grants of $59,000 and ongoing annual savings of $35,000 for the municipality. That's an example of what an energy coordinator can help to do. Projects originated by the regional en energy coordinator will also help to create jobs in the region. Vermont now has 19,000 clean energy jobs and nearly 80% of every dollar spent on fossil fuels goes out of state in comparison. So if you vote to approve this article for Woodstock's share of the funding to hire a regional energy coordinator, the vote will help the town to meet its officially adapted energy goals, to potentially save tens of thousands of dollars in energy costs in the coming decades, and help residents to do their part to fight climate change and carry forward Woodstock's legacy of stewardship for this and future generations. And I think that's a really important piece because a lot of the strategizing that we tend to do in our towns is fairly five, maybe five, a long term is considered 10 years. But the costs that we're incurring, social, environmental, and economic costs by not doing these kinds of regional solutions is kicking the can down the road for our children and grandchildren to have to deal with these costs and issues. So um, Sustainable Woodstock strongly encourages you to support Article 11. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, right up behind you, Hudson. And then we'll get, I'm sorry, Jeffrey. Yep. Uh, I'm Beverly Huntstone, and I'm on design review. And a few weeks ago, I called Michael Brands because I had driven by Mount Tom and was alarmed to see the solar panels that were put up there. To me and to a lot of people that I've talked to, Mount Tom has a real historic spot. I respect the... Um, Rainbow Element uh, Kindergarten or Nursery School that is there, but I can't imagine how you would all feel if solar panels were put on Suicide 6. I'm questioning whether this energy person will help protect us and guide us as to the appropriate spot for solar. Michael Brand tells me that in the state of Vermont, we have no control over where they go. So I was really upset, and I'm still upset, by the solar panels, which may save us energy, but they ruined that hill. Jeff? Uh, yeah, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment would be, first of all, I, I think it's a great idea to have uh, such a person as Lipton proposed. I don't really think that the way it's split out is necessarily was based on um, a, a good decision, especially when I consider that Woodstock, which has a smaller population than Norwich, is paying 20% more than Norwich to be part of this program. I, I see the way they, they did it. I don't think it's correct. Um, but the question is, what happens if one of these towns decides not to contribute? What happens at that point So each of the seven towns has a, a motion like this for their town meetings. Um, and when we, when we get the results of all those, we have to consider how we do this. So for example, if only half the money was raised, then we would um, perhaps consider employing a part-time person to do this job. So it's a dis we have to view this as a discussion and we're at the first stages of it by approving these monies so that we can take part in that discussion or not. All right, we'll go to Zoe and Molly, can you bring it all the way down to the front and then we'll get to you, Ed. Good afternoon. Um, Jill, just clarify for me, um, was a grant explored for the payment of this person? Um, is that a possibility? Uh, no grant has been explored so far. Um, 
the Nick Clark who put this together is quite uh, knowledgeable about these kind of things and, and he did not explore a grant. He, we chose to go this way forwards and um, want the person to be able to apply for grants in future to help this work. So there was no, I'm sorry, there was just, there was no grant applied for this position, although that could be a possibility, you chose not to? I don't know of any grants that would do this, but um, if we wanted to do that, we'd have to explore possible sources and take the time, and we don't think there's that kind of time to be taken. Yes. So, um, again, it's Mark McElroy. I work in the field of sustainability and am generally predisposed in support of uh, proposals like this. But I, I do have a couple of, of concerns in this case. Um, the first one is um, on the question of what we can reasonably expect this person to bring to the table, if you will, in terms of identifying opportunities for improvement that are already not there. Um, and, uh, you know, as I look at what we're already doing in Woodstock, for example, I mentioned earlier, uh, as I understand it, that uh, the figure is something like 100% of the energy used in our municipal facilities um, is uh, already uh, renewable, um, solar-based uh, uh, energy. So the, you know, the opportunity for improvement there is uh, pretty much minimal. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we have other implementations of, of solar uh, taking place um, all over town. Uh, anyone who is using uh, Green Mountain Power, uh, whether you have solar panels on your house or not, uh, you're already uh, uh, experiencing a, a case where 90% of your energy use is coming from um, renewable sources, in other words, 90% of your energy, your electric, electrical energy, um, is carbon free uh, based on the way uh, Green Mountain Power produces um, its energy. And, um, you know, what's left, of course, is uh, the extent to which we're all still using fossil fuels, um, gasoline, oil, other fossil fuels, even, even biomass. Um, uh, is a source of carbon, of course, but uh, so transportation as a sector um, in Vermont in particular is uh, relatively high um, and it's it's an area of untapped uh, opportunity, uh, but it's one that I think uh, at the town level uh, we're really not just Woodstock, but any town is not very well positioned uh, to do anything about, uh, which is why uh, the state uh, itself, uh, Charlie, I spoke to you earlier about the TCI uh, legislation, is working on that very problem. So unless you know our energy coordinator is gonna come to the table with a proposal that Woodstock provide tax credits uh, to its residents to uh, either retrofit uh, their homes with um, you know, non-fossil fuel-based heating, which is another uh, broad sector where opportunities for improvement lie, uh, or you know, tax credits that we can all use to purchase electric vehicles. Um, it's not clear to me that a town-level uh, initiative, uh, whether it's shared with other towns or, or not, um, can reasonably be expected to bring uh, you know, incremental improvement to the table uh, beyond improvements that we've already identified and that we're already taking advantage of and that are already available to us. So that's my first concern. Um, the second concern uh, has to do with the distribution of the, you know, the split arrangement with the, the other six towns. Um, as I say, I work in this field, I know a little bit about uh, what needs to be done to do this kind of work. And I am really hard pressed uh, to uh, believe that this person can be effective 
uh, doing what has been uh, proposed in, in this position for seven towns. And you know, as far as the Hartford example is concerned, uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that that was one person, one town. That's not what we're talking about here. So I'm not sure the Hartford experience is really comparable. Thank you. Um, Doug has a microphone. Eddie, I didn't forget you. You're, you're next, and then we'll, Molly can go straight back. This is a difficult one for me to speak to because I think that it, there is value in, 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 this, in this role. Sorry, thanks. Um, this is, a, however, I think the way you, the way you presented it, it, it is an experiment. And I think, um, I think one way to fund that experiment is, is by seeking a grant. I believe you said the Hartford employee is compensated partially with with grants at least, I believe you. Uh, you the Hartford employee that. is a, a salaried person by Hartford. Mm -hmm. He has uh, sought grants to pay for some of the improvement work that have been done. I see. I just think that this experiment would be appropriately funded um, via a grant. I think Jeff pointed out very well, and, and you just echoed that, that uh, this is, a, this is a, Woodstock is paying more than our fair share of this uh, um, this, this person's uh, salary and benefits. Um, let's, I, I'm all for the role, but let's, let's, let's try to find a grant. Let's try to find a, a one-year grant for this person to fund it that way and, and not the taxpayers. Uh, Ed had oh, a uh, comment. Yeah, let's yeah. hire a grant writer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a question to Charlie. Uh, what is, how far does the state get involved in this uh, sort of a thing? This, um, well, what I want to say is, what, what does, how far does the state get involved in these uh, uh, yeah. Energy efficiency? Yeah, this energy efficiency. What are their comment? What are the requirements for, from the state to get involved in the uh, where they go or something? I wasn't prepared to exactly talk on this. My name is Charlie Kimball, uh, but. The state is involved with many different areas in energy efficiency. Um, one is providing some weatherization grants for low-income households to weatherize their homes. Uh, provided a lot of money over time, and that's been made available through organizations such as the Heat Squad and other organizations uh, supplying that type of service. It's about $8,500 per household. Efficiency Vermont receives uh, funds from all ratepayers, uh, and that does go into uh, different funds and there's an initiative to try to get that expanded beyond electricity savings so you can look at heating savings and other uh, fuel savings as well. Um, so there is also um, some stretch goals for housing as to what kind of energy efficiency they're supposed to accomplish in any new building projects uh, that are for low income or moderate income households. So there are a lot of ways but in specific answer to this request um, that there is not necessarily a state role and the role of an energy coordinator to advise uh, local municipalities. So it's a totally local thing. So does it fit into what um, some of the legislation that has been passed regarding trying to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases? Yes, but that commission hasn't even ex uh, st been stood up yet, hasn't been created. Does that, does that help? Okay, all right. Yeah. We have Sure. Yeah. Uh, can you get a microphone over here? So we have lost one of our microphone owners. Thanks. So um, I, I understand Mark's concerns about the 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 demonstrable. Um, effectiveness of this position or this person at, at actually lowering energy consumption or lowering greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'm gonna address this from a, a kind of a different place that 
as many people have said today, we are looking to make this town attractive to people to move here and make this town a place that people kind of look at as a, as a, as a progressive place. Now, this experiment may or may not work in terms of, of producing significant cost savings or demonstrable greenhouse gas savings in one year. But what it does do is it's something that, that we can point to and say to a young family who's thinking about moving up here from someplace else and who's very concerned about the future for, for themselves and for their kids and for their grandkids, that here's a town that's looking to the future. And, here's a t and so, you know, from just a PR standpoint, and I know we don't have a PR agency, but just from a PR standpoint, I think this is something that we should consider. And also, I, people are going to get sick of listening to me saying this, but any kind of experiment in regionalization is vital because there are so many things that we are not going to be able to do as just a town in terms of the costs of doing business. And as, you know, our budgets are going up every year and they're gonna keep going up every year unless we find economies of scale. So we need to look for regionalization opportunities and maybe, maybe this one will work or maybe it won't, but I think it's worth a try. All right, I w there's more people who wanna speak over here, Hudson, and then we'll get over to you to Anne. Um, just very quickly, there's a lot of talk about let's get a grant, let's get a grant, let's get a grant. I've been spending a lot of time writing grants. You not might, and there might not be a grant to hire somebody. Some of you hire somebody, and they can go out and get grants for projects. But I haven't seen a lot of grants for actually hiring people. Right behind. What? Hold on, Hudson. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I saw you before, sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, I think, number one, I think this is a fantastic idea, especially making it regional. I do have a question about um, serving more than one master. Um, how, I know that this is gonna be by committee, how do you anticipate um, that committee working together well to take the recommendations and either implement them as a region or individually and then sort of as a follow-up to that, how, when that person makes recommendations, what is then the mechanism regionally and in individual towns for paying for those things? I understand we can put things on our, like should we be expecting in the coming years um, more similar proposals that say, you know, do we wanna pay X number of dollars if the other six want to pay an X number of dollars for something. Because this person will come in and make recommendations, but then they'll have to be paid for. So what, what is the process for the decision making about what we individually and what we as a region decide to do or not to do, and then how do we decide to pay for it or not pay for it? So this, this person will have one master, and that's the Two Rivers Otakuchi Planning Group. They will be directed by the committee, um, just as EC Fiber works with the committee at, of multiple towns. Um, and then when they propose things that are done by any individual town, it will be up to the select board or the village trustees to accept or, or reject it. So for example, one of the proposals might be to, um, to buy a police car that is um, a hybrid or an electric vehicle. Um, it's still going to be the village that buys that vehicle and has to make that decision. But there'll be an expert voice there. This person will provide the expert voice to, s to give an alternative viewpoint. Yes, there were some gentlemen over here. And then uh, my name's Jeff Martin, and um, I'm the energy coordinator for the town of Hartford. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a Woodstock resident. Um, and so I just want to support this position. I wanted to address a few of the, the questions that have come up or some of the points that came up. Um, first about, will this, will this person be able to help uh, with, with solar siting or renewable siting? Um, I think the answer is yes, because municipalities actually do have a lot of control over where renewables are sited. Um, they have to have what's called an enhanced energy plan to have that kind of control. And that's something that I worked on in Hartford over the past couple of years is developing that enhanced energy plan. Um, and then once you have that, you have, the town has more control over where renewables are or are not cited. Um, to the point about, you know, what can this person do that, that we don't already know we have to do? 
I think that's a, a good point, and I think the reality is we know what we have to do, we just have to do it. And uh, it's hard when you're a town staff person and it's not your, your job uh, to do these things and you're trying to do them on top of everything else that you have to do. And it's also hard if you're a volunteer and you're trying to get things done for a town. Um, there's only so much time that volunteers can put in. So um, I think that's, that's one of the, the biggest benefits to having someone in this role. Um, I wrote down a couple of notes here. Oh yeah, the question about um, you know, what can, what can this person do if, if they're overseeing uh, this type of work of, of for seven towns? Um, I think that's a legitimate question. It's one that I had when the position was first proposed. And, um, but I think that, again, because we know what the solutions are, um, it, you know, it, it's the same solutions are gonna be applicable for all seven towns. It's just, again, it's about developing a plan and uh, making sure that that plan gets implemented. <coughs> Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that the select board recently uh, passed a climate emergency declaration, which is wonderful. I'm very appreciative that they, that they did that uh, because this, we are in a climate emergency um, and we need to act like that. And uh, one of the goals of the climate emergency declaration uh, was, is to get the, the town to, um, to net zero emissions by 2030. And I think that's, doable. It's going to be uh, very difficult to get there, but it is doable, um, especially if there is someone that is overseeing uh, that plan and the implementation of a plan to get there. And I think if we don't hire someone uh, to do this, it's not going to happen. Um, and so finally, um, on the, the question about, you know, should we look for a grant to, to uh, fund this position, um, that would be ideal, but I think that you know, we, we'll miss the opportunity if, if we put this off because six other towns are looking at the same question right now. Um, so this is our this is our chance. Right, right in the middle, that's um, cut. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, and then and McSuda. Um. So my name is Emma Allegretti, and I'm here representing Change the World Kids, which is a teen-run nonprofit here in Woodstock. So we helped get petitions signed to support the climate emergency resolution, so thank you for passing that. Um, we hope Article 11 will also be passed as it is important to collaborate with other towns to hire an energy coordinator to help us meet our greenhouse gas emissions goals and start rebuilding a renewable energy infrastructure. So thank you very much. Can you go right in the middle, Hudson? Sure. Thank you, um, I just wanted to um, I guess it was Jeff's concern about paying more than Norwich or paying the largest amount of all the towns. Um, and I don't understand uh, how they came up with that really, but I do know that if my, if my property is assessed at $200,000, then I'd be paying $4 a year and then it goes up. So you can do the math. It's not a big bite uh, to get somebody who is going to be focusing on the greatest need that humanity has ever had. So um, I just think that um, I'm hoping all the towns will do this experiment and then we'll see. I, I, I respect uh, Mark's knowledge in this field, but it's almost made it sound like there's nothing we can do. And when the select board and the trustees accepted this uh, climate emergency petition, it does call for a 10-year plan. So if we don't have this person, the plan won't get done. So I, I think it's worth a try, since it's really not very expensive. Thanks. Can you hand the microphone straight back to Jennifer? Did you have a comment, Jennifer? So why you live here? Why don't we hire you? <laughs> I want to know why we aren't hiring him. Okay, why aren't we hiring him? He lives here, and I would help him write the grants. I will donate my time, and we, have, you know, we probably would get more of an effort if we didn't have to split it with seven towns, but we're paying 40% of, of that budget for one person, and we're dividing it between seven towns. So, you know, I'm only saying we already have the talent here, so, you know, maybe this is a, in 
this is somebody that we can help <laughs> employ more and um, you know have the same end goal. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not the article that's written. <laughs> <laughs> but we could amend it. <laughs> you can't change it from what's going on. Substantially. Yes, Mary? Um, I'll give you a little history, too. For 14 years, that has been an energy committee working in Woodstock. And I've seen many people come and go on that committee. And in 2010, at our town meeting, we agreed to expand our energy consumption. We have had no one to lead us in that attempt. We've had a letter in the paper this week about making the emergency services building at zero. It's been talked about here today about that building and other things here in Woodstock. And I see out there people who have worked on this energy committee for all this time. They come, they go, they come back, they serve again. I really think that this article deserves your support because this is an opportunity to move forward with some of the work this Energy Committee has tried to do for 14 years. This is the first person, this is the first opportunity we've had to have someone really lead us. Jill was appointed as the Select Board's representative to the energy effort a few years ago, and she has followed through. She wrote this article and the gentleman who wrote this plan to us. And it's one year. It doesn't have to come back next year. Or maybe by then Jeff will be looking for a job. We don't know. But right now he's not available to us, Jennifer. But um, consider this carefully. Thank you. Jeff, can you do that? Yeah, Just a couple of quick um, sort of clarifications and points. So Woodstock does, because of the work of the Energy Committee that Mary was referring to, we do have an enhanced energy plan which does give us more control over where our solar and other energy um, infrastructure is sited. Sustainable Woodstock does a lot of grant writing and we will be working closely with the town and with whoever is hired, even if it's not Jeff, to write grants to help with projects that may come up from, this, um, from the regional energy uh, coordinators work and as far as the valuation goes in whatever town the split is the amount of money going um, towards this from any household would be ten dollars for a two hundred fifty thousand dollar valuation of property twenty for five hundred thousand dollars etc the same exact amount for every town which stocks is higher because our property is worth more overall and as far as just a point, I don't know if you're aware of this, Mark, and I appreciate all your, your sharing, but Green Mountain Power does tout its renewable energy portfolio. I think it's really important to remember that there's still a very small percentage of renewable energy through Green Mountain Power from solar in the state. And the reason that Green Mountain Power says it has such a high percentage of renewable power is, and you have to go back, so this is almost um, something for the, the Vermont uh, Woodstock History Center. You have to go back to Howard Dean. Howard Dean made a huge arrangement with what, what was then, I think, Trans Canada, or even maybe their predecessor, to buy a, a significant amount of hydropower from what was Hydro Quebec at the time, is now Trans Canada. And that is the renewable energy that makes up most of Green Mountain Power's portfolio. There were huge environmental um, impacts of flooding hundreds of thousands of acres of traditional land among the Inuit. It displaced peoples, it displaced villages, it destroyed hunting grounds. So Vermont has this kind of nice piece of our renewable energy portfolio and the, the um, repercussions of that are in someone else's backyard. As far as what we're producing here in Vermont and in, in renewables, it's still pretty small and really needs to grow to make a difference. I just wanted to point that out. Jill? Um, I'd like to move the question. Is there a second? Is there a second? There's a, a motion second. made. Second. Motion made and seconded to move the question. All those in favor of closing debate and voting on Article 11, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. 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 Uh, 
the, the articles passed. So Article 11 shall the town of Woodstock raise 37,000 for regional energy coordinator. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Article 11 is adopted. Um, before we get into Article 12, I will point out we've, we've dealt with all the money issues that we can vote on today. So that's the good news. We have 23 more articles to go. That being said, I would strongly urge those of you who wish to speak on behalf of different organizations to be concise in your comments in the interest of valuing everyone's time. If, if it drags on too long, we may have to put a time limit on how long people can speak. So Article 12, to entertain the discussion of any other business of interest to the legal voters, such discussion shall not be construed in any manner as binding municipal action. Uh, this would be a great time for you to speak, Dave. D Dave Brown has some comments, and I'll get to you, Jeffrey, and shoot it. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I'm Dave Brown, and I'm one of the EC Fiber delegates uh, from Woodstock. Thank you to the select board for appointing me and Alex Rozek and Dan Orcutt. And uh, we look forward to, to being reappointed uh, this year. Um, and I know some of you are saying, oh, yeah, here's the part where Dave explains where Woodstock is at the end of the line, and we're never going to get connected to the network. Well. One of the things I learned recently about uh, lines, because we were at Walt Disney World, maybe you've had a similar experience, that if you're at the end of a long, long line, if you wait long enough, pretty soon, you're at the front of the line. It's really quite miraculous. Well, I know you've waited a really, really long time, and I've been at it for 13 years. Um, but guess what? Woodstock is now at the front of the line. Yay. In fact, already last fall, we connected 100 uh, Woodstock residents to the network, and we have a really ambitious plan for this, this year. It's 2020 already, isn't it? Uh, so uh, we've already built 1,000 miles of network and connected almost 4,300 people. Uh, so. Uh, Woodstock is in the spotlight. Uh, we're going to do great things here this year. The important thing is, if you if you want to be connected, you got to sign up. Uh, now, I know there are a lot of people who have questions for me, mostly when you're coming to my house. Uh, I can't answer them all. Uh, look for a meeting sometime in the middle of March, where we'll be happy to to answer all those questions and, and get it all out on the table. But in the meantime, thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, hopefully when I'm here next year, we can all be saying, yay, we've, we, we've got connected. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Jeff, you had a. I'm Jeff Kahn. I'm currently chair of the Woodstock Village Board of Trustees. Uh, I just, before more people leave, uh, I want to make sure everyone understands what's happened this past year in terms of your two locally elected boards. Uh, I've served in different decades uh, in the village board, and I've never had an experience like this past year where the town board, the select board, and the village trustees have worked so well together for joint purpose. Um, it's been extraordinary and it's been very rewarding, and it's been a tremendous amount of time because of our loss of Phil and because of our finding a new town manager, an interim, and then a, a new town manager, there's been a lot of extra meetings in the mornings, um, in the evenings, as well as our regularly scheduled appointments, <coughs> plus all the work both boards have been doing, whether it's short-term rental work or some of the other work you've heard about today the select board's been involved in. Although there's been one round of applause, I've got to tell you the folks up there have done an extraordinary job for Woodstock and deserve another round of applause. Can you hand that right over to Jason? So, can I sit? <laughs> Whatever you like. Uh, I'm just going to put a plug in for everybody to run the numbers before Tuesday. Uh, my comment earlier about the cumulative impact is really important. 
Um, I, I calculate it, and someone will have to check my math, but we're approaching close to a 9% tax increase uh, before we get to Tuesday. Um, and that includes both the education taxes and our municipal taxes. It's really confusing because when you see a percent increase on the municipal budget, that's not your total tax bill, right? And then likewise on the education uh, increases. So the, if you look at the education um, tax increases, there's a CLA piece, which some, someone else can explain, but it's a 6% it's a increase. That's a 6% six, 6 increase for the town of Woodstock on your education tax rate. That's handed to us by the state. Nothing we can do about that. Uh, that doesn't mean your taxes are going up 6%. That means your education taxes are going up 6%. So you can do the math, multiplication. And you do the same here with this, right? We passed the, the town budget, which was a 3.8% increase. That's a 3.8% increase on your, municipal, on your municipal taxes. So run the numbers before leading into Tuesday because it's, we're getting up there in terms of the total cumulative impact. And each article we vote through uh, has a uh, kind of duplicate or a multiplicative effect. So it, it's also important that everyone files their homestead um, declarations. You know, it, it matters how you pay your taxes. That's an important piece. So I just want to add a comment to Jason's uh, comment. So look in the handout and then you'll see the impact of each of these articles in dollars, not percentages. It's much easier to understand. Okay, uh, down here and then we'll oh, come over to Seth right after that. So this is just something that I think really needs to be on the radar of town government sooner rather than later. And unfortunately it probably means spending some more money. We have this beautiful book that was wonderfully produced. As far as I can tell, it's not online on the website. Um, it is very hard to tell if it's online on the website because the website was, is, is ancient. Um, you're using technology on, on the town of Woodstock website that has not been updated in this century. <laughs> and that's very insecure. It's very hard to use it as a, as a flexible communications tool to make sure that all of the good work that's done is communicated and people have the opportunity to have input. So my suggestion is just to get this on the radar sooner rather than later because I think Otherwise, it's going to turn around and bite us. And I think we could also do a more effective job at, at using our website to open up government as much as possible to the people of the town. Yes, uh, Seth Webb. Oh, Alita's got it, I think. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to uh, say thanks to the select board. Um, please don't confuse anxiety about rising costs um, and how we're addressing them uh, with deep appreciation for what you do. Uh, you're essentially unpaid volunteers and you're putting a ton of time into it and very grateful for the time that you've spent. Um, two, I, I think uh, I, I just wanted to, I, I have, I think this is appropriate for now, but we can uh, speak about anything under this. I, I wanted to express m my support for Kerry Cole in the upcoming election, um, and just give you a couple of reasons why. Um, one, she's very well qualified. She's a businesswoman, a volunteer, a member, and a, she's run lots of board, been on boards in civic and civic engagement, a lot of things in town, um, from Pentangle to the Planning Commission, BDBRB. Uh, she and her husband Ben have have really invested here. And, and are raising a family, and she's highly educated. She's been to schools that would never take me, like Harvard and Berkeley, and um, uh, and, and and that translations into to very high intelligence. It, you know that if you've spent any time with her, and I really think she would make a difference in helping us address a lot of the things that we're facing, um, and and that's largely because I've spent the last ten years talking to her about those things. Uh, I uh, moved here ten years ago. Um, I uh, came here for the quality of life, and, uh, and now I'm raising a, a young family. So I really think she would bring an important perspective to these discussions that are happening outside of town meeting, um, at all the select board meetings year round, and having that, that perspective of businesses and families is, is critical, um, especially because of all the things that we're facing that we've been talking about today. 
declining population, rising costs, lack of year-round employment, lack of affordable housing. You know, a lot of us, when we think about young families and, and what's gonna make people come here and stay, and I, I'm 45, so I'm really not that young anymore. Um, you know, but we talk about it in our household. It's, it's like we want a place that's more than a retirement community and a destination for wealthy vacationers um, and wedding goers. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we want more out of our community than that. And uh, we want to live in a place that, that's not only addressing the challenges I've laid out, but making progress. And I, I think that was referenced in some of the other comments today. Um, my, my last thing is, I, I think we have a, one of the best things about Vermont is the participation in local government. And I think if you look at the, the rates of participation in our government right now, uh, they're bad. And, uh, and nobody's talking about this, but um, uh, in the last three elections, participation has been at 21 to 28 percent. That's one in five people or w one in four people are, are turning out to vote. If, if we look at who's here today, it's less than one percent. Um, and lack of participation is, is, a, is a sign of, of failing democracy. Uh, it's a missed opportunity. This is, I don't want to take any, anything away from the great discussion today, but it's a missed opportunity when we don't have more voices in the room. And uh, it leads to apathy and further disenfranchisement. And, and there's some big problems that we have to tackle here. And it's going to require consensus uh, among more people that are in this room and, and more people that are participating. And if we have someone like Carrie on the board that brings that perspective, she's going to be able to help bring, bring more of those pr perspectives to, to the board. Because I know I haven't had time to, to devote and, uh, to, to something like this, but I know that she'll represent my voice. So I don't think we can really wait an, another year uh, to start addressing this. And more importantly, uh, if we didn't elect her, it would be a real missed opportunity. Um, to have someone who would donate this kind of time and have to manage a fam family and a, a job and all those things um, that, that are demanding would, would, is, really, is really a terrific opportunity for us. So I just wanted to express my support. Um, I don't know if she's here. All the way up oh, in the back. There she is. She's hiding. So, and, and thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll get the microphone to you. I just wanted to... Um, before he has to go, say thank you to Hudson for, for working today. He's, um, <laughs> he was voluntold as usual. Um, and, and he has to leave because his grandmother's taking him to dinner and they have to be there an hour before the doors open. It, it's a generational thing. <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, yes, Dave. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo a couple of comments that were made about sort of the long-term thinking that may need to go into how we consider our budgets in the future and whether or not there's an opportunity to engage more people by looking at um, committees and subcommittees that look not only about the things that we need to do improve, but also how we might increase our revenue. Um, I've I've spoken to a few folks about potential opportunities, particularly given that we're a tourist community. When I look at some of these um, articles that we'll be voting on on Tuesday, in particular 15 and I believe 16, and this relates to my observation earlier, is you know what are the priorities that we have? And clearly, as I was instructed, and I didn't understand that at the time, that I guess they're priorities that we determine, but do we have the opportunity to look more broadly at what's coming down the road? We heard this morning um, from our, our state representatives that they're looking at opportunities for regionalization, and when I look at those two particular um, articles, it appears that there's opportunities for regionalization and have those proposals considered an opportunity for regionalization. Are we going to be spending a fairly significant amount of money, amount of money in both cases to put in place something locally that the would then potentially be overcome by a regional response? So as someone said earlier, do the numbers. When you look at the numbers, these are the two largest um, 
uh, economic issues that you'll be voting on, and is there opportunity to consider regionalization opportunities before we move down the path of doing something that we might have to change? Thank you. Any other? Yes, right over here. Alita's got it, I think. Hi. <clears throat> my name is Wendy Marin, and I just want to get my voice. Um, I want to say thank you again to the select board and also to all the people that have come here today and shared their thoughts and their ideas because it's hugely helpful as a resident to factor in different perspectives. To that end, I want to support Seth's comments that showing up at select board meetings and showing up at our uh, trustee, village trustee meetings planning commission meetings. I've taken uh, more time in my life to do so recently. It's really helpful. It's helpful to the individual. It's helpful to the people doing this hard work. So um, I want to uh, take this point and make, take this opportunity to bring to your attention uh, an ongoing dialogue that's happening with the select board and with the Village Board of Trustees uh, via a proposal that you can read about in the annual report. And the Billings Park Commission has put a proposal through, or through working with uh, a trust representative. So before I get specific, I'm gonna start big picture. Our town has really benefited from some amazing benefactors. And we can't forget that, and I do feel a certain level of responsibility to carry on those traditions in respecting what's been given us to steward. And specifically, we, we know the big names, but uh, I wanna bring to the table uh, Marianne, Marianne Faulkner's Faulkner Park. Uh, this is this is on Mount Nav. I'm sure you all know where it is, the park. Um, there's a proposal uh, that the trust, Faulkner Trust managed by J.P. Morgan in New York, that perhaps uh, the trust would hand the ownership and a specified amount of money over to the town. And this, this idea has actually been in dialogue for more than a year since December 2018, as far as we can figure out. Um, but m suddenly and very close to the moment of when the proposal was made to the select board, local neighbors, local residents found out about it accidentally. Now, first off, that's not the way we want to find out about things <laughs> and then rush to a meeting we didn't have on our calendar. But second, uh, it's, it's a proposal that has brought many people, or started many people thinking, is this really the right way to go? And there are a lot of reasons uh, to think hard about this. Uh, I'm gonna hand the mic, if I may, to uh, Linda Smitty, who, who would like to bring you all up to speed to what has been presented to the select board and to the trustees so that the right amount of information is all here and not scattered and misunderstood. Yes, is that go okay? ahead. Hi, I'm Linda Smitty, and I will try to be uh, brief about this proposal. The uh, discussions about the transfer of Faulkner Park to the town actually began in December of 2018, as uh, Wendy just said, but they weren't made public. Neither the select board, the village trustees, nor the neighbors, nor the community knew about them until November of 2019, and that was a surprise that all of us had. There, um, and essentially, this is part, this proposal uh, from the uh, 
perspective of J.P. Morgan, who is the trustee for the Faulkner Park. It's part of a trend of New York banks uh, to rid themselves of real estate because real, real estate is troublesome for them to manage and to keep uh, the financial resources of a trust. Now, in some respects, the transfer uh, to the town may on first impression seem um, quite appropriate, more local control over the park. The problem, there are several problems with this. First of all, under the current situation, the, um, the uh, J.P. Morgan, the trustee, has all financial responsibility for the park, has all liability for the park, uh, and the burdens, and as well as the benefits of managing the park, rest with Faulkner, uh, with the Faulkner Trust. It's a, the park is a private park that has been open for public use since the 1930s, according to Marianne Faulkner's specific will. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details of the transfer, but I want you to know that there are, uh, I'm a member of what's called the Faulkner Park Working Group. It's a group right now, but growing, of 31 homeowners in Woodstock who are very concerned about this transfer. And for several reasons, one of which I'll just give you an example. The report in the town, uh, in the town report, the report by the Billings Commission, um, mentions the, this transfer in two paragraphs, but does not include a lot of key information. Yes, the uh, J.P. Morgan is willing to transfer to uh, the town of Woodstock, $850,000 in support of this proposal. But the problem is, uh, if you do the numbers, that money is going to run out. And if you look at the underlying documents of the Billings Park Commission and others, there is part of this plan, a plan to hire a community park manager whose salary in Vermont, according to the Vermont Bureau of Labor Statistics, ranges from 49,000 to 79,000 annually and when you add on the benefits, then that range is 69,000 up to 100,000. Uh, if you run the numbers, even using all of the numbers in the, in the current proposal, the money's going to run out in nine years. At that point, the Woodstock community voters will be faced with assuming the financial responsibility for the park, which according to the Park Commission, making the transfer. The problem is that while those efficiencies may uh, exist, and there's no reason to doubt it, uh, from our perspective, there's no accounting in that report or in other documents for Many of the direct costs were not even included in the calculus, uh, and none of the indirect costs of the towns managing the park were included. Now, the Woodstock, um, the Woodstock uh, Faulkner Park Working Group simply wants the uh, select board and the village trustees to say no to this proposal and to explore other ways, and there are other less expensive ways that would provide a way of coordinating uh, the possibility for greater local control with working with the trust. I mean, there's uh, having greater local control on deciding what trees will be cut, et cetera, makes perfect sense. But we feel that, and the records indicate, alternative ways have not been explored. 
we're perfectly willing as a group to put in the time and the effort to work with the Billings Park Commission and other citizens of the community, including neighbors and others, to develop a workable proposal that is um, makes financial sense for the town of Woodstock. So we encourage you to um, ask, as we are, we have asked the select board simply to say no thank you to this proposal and to explore other ways that may ac uh, accomplish benefits for all the parties concerned without Woodstock assuming a disproportionate uh, share of the financial burden and the liabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ed? Right across from you, Ed? I'd remind everyone we still have a lot of ground to cover. I, I realize this, but can we table this? This is not, there's, there's, um, this is to discuss any business of interest to the legal voters. So if we just stop talking, it's effectively tabled. Well, there, there are oh, other motions to come, but, but people have the right to a, speak. Then what kind of a motion do I need to make? There's, there's no question to move, Ed. I think you've been heard, though. If there are no, no other questions or comments under Article 12, we can move on to Article 13. All right, Article 13. The election of town officers for the ensuing year is required by law. These are Australian ballot um, voting, but if there's anybody here who is running for one of these offices who would like to take, make a brief statement, uh, you have a limited audience here, but you're welcome to. Ray? Hi, I'm Ray Bourgeois, and um, I was appointed to the select board back in June 2019, and I was unanimously appointed, and I am running for this three-year position select board. I feel my background in infrastructure, building management, project management, budgeting um, will help in the future of all these projects that are coming on and the work that has to be done on the infrastructure in the town. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Anyone else? <laughs> Carrie? Uh, Matt, Carrie's up behind you. She was next. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you, Sam. Go ahead. I didn't see you, Sam. I'm right here. Um, hi, I'm Sam Dianatale. I've been on the school board for the last two years. I'm running unopposed for another um, seat for three years. Um, I'm mostly just stating um, my support on 117 for our um, budget, especially Article 2 about um, everyone um, agreeing to the Bonner School District joining um, the Unified Union District. I would hope that everyone would vote yes for that. There's been a lot of work involved with it. If you have any questions, there's a lot of information on the WCSU website regarding this merger and how it would be helpful for all of us and a good asset for them to merge with us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Carrie. I'm Carrie Cole. Um, I'm finishing up my third year as a village trustee. Uh, my husband and I moved here in 2010 to open the Blue Horse Inn. Um, and I've, we've never imagined falling in love with a tiny little town, but we have, and here we are. And we have two young kids that we're looking forward to putting through the school system. My husband sits on the school board. Um, and I would relish the opportunity to grow my service to this town and help as we make some really important, strategic, comprehensive decisions about investments in this community to make sure that it is a thriving place for all of us, for our children, for visitors and for our children's children. Thanks. <laughs> Since candidates are introducing themselves, hi, my name is Seton McElroy. I am running for village trustee. Um, I am a mom of two kids in the in uh, Woodstock Elementary School. Seamus is eight, and Piper 
He's six. If you've seen a little redhead with curly hair, like bouncing all over the places, jumping in puddles, that's my daughter. I apologize if she splashes you. Um, so I'm running for village trustee because um, we've been embraced by this community since literally the day we got here. Um, I will tell you, just as an aside about Carrie, um, she was the real estate agent for the house we bought. And in the first week, my smoke detector went off and would not stop. And I called her because I didn't know who else to call. And God bless her, she called an electrician who was there in like an hour. And then she called Chief Blish. And then she came over to my house when my flood, when my basement flooded, and she gave me her shop vac. Um, and it hasn't just been her. There have been so many people here who have been so helpful and so welcoming. Um, and I have a background in communications, um, website, content management. Um, legislation, um, all those things. I have told lots of people I'm a legislative nerd. Like today is like Christmas for me. I just, I love hearing all of this. Um, and I'm originally from a small town, so I just, I love being able to help people. Um, and I do like getting into the nitty gritty. I'm somebody who has lots of energy. I've always loved volunteering. Um, and again, you know, this is the place we, we chose to raise our children. Um, it took a long time for us to move to Vermont because it's very expensive and it's very difficult. <laughs> and so this has been a plan for us for a very long time. And now that we're here and we've been so welcomed, um, I can't help but want to help the town um, keep it as great as it is, try to figure out new opportunities for the future. You know, when climate change makes the ski season shorter, what do we do? When the leaf peepers can only be here for a week, what do we do? You know, those sorts of things um, I'd like to help tackle and to make the website a little bit more user friendly. So thank you so much. This is a great opportunity to launch your write-in campaign for Grand Juror. <laughs> All right, if there is nobody else who wants to speak about Article 13. Article 14, shall general obligation bonds or notes of the town of Woodstock in an amount not to exceed $2,800,000, subject to reduction from the receipt of available state and federal grants in aid and other financial assistance, be issued for the purpose of financing the cost of constructing upgrades to the South Woodstock Wastewater Treatment Facility, the estimated cost of such improvements being $2,800,000. And so this is by Australian ballot, but, and we did have an information meeting about this this morning as well. For those of you that missed the information meeting, I'll try to be extremely brief. The South Woodstock uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility is 53 years old, designed to process 50,000 gallons a day, the state is closely behind us, um, essentially demanding that we seriously renovate it uh, or replace it. As I said this morning, um, the renovation uh, is more expensive than the replacement, according to our alternatives analysis. The intention is to replace a package plant with a package plant. The example I used this morning was, it's a little like your washing machine. Um, stuff goes in, stuff comes out. Um, if you need a new one, you move the old one aside, plug in the new one and, and keep on washing clothes. Uh, this plant, uh, we believe we can construct, uh, while the existing plant continues to operate, um, it is a general obligation bond of the town. However, it is paid for uh, through your utility bill, through your sewer bill. And on page 10 of the handout that was in the lobby, uh, we've estimated uh, the uh, increases in the, uh, in the sewer fees uh, that will uh, accommodate the payment of the bond on this plant. Uh, Single person household will go up $92 a year. Two person household, 136. A family would be 185. And then the commercial facilities um, are $1.85 per 100 cubic feet. And I would do questions. I can attest that at 53 years, you start to feel your age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Matt? Yes. Laird? Laird? Uh, 
There's one coming behind you later. It's everywhere. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, how many people uh, are served by the uh, septic system in South Woodstock? And I assume it's a secondary treatment, not tertiary treatment plant. Is there, are there any downstream consequences to uh, the uh, flow through? The number of folks in South Woodstock is fairly small. I think it's maybe 40 or 45 houses. Um, and the uh, horse farm and the uh, inn uh, the, and the store, the commercial facilities. Um, it's secondary treatment, advanced secondary treatment. Um, this plant will be more effective with the phosphorus uh, withdrawal and uh, will hopefully deal with the, uh, with the issues of nitrogen, uh, which are becoming more, a little more profound. Uh, I don't want to get carried away, but our nitrogen limits are based on the total daily maximum load in Long Island Sound. Uh, so it's hard to believe a 50,000 gallon plant out in South Woodstock is going to make an appreciable difference in Long Island Sound, but uh, it, it works its way all the way back up into the headwaters. But this, this would be a, uh, the exact design of the plant is still being uh, uh, considered, but uh, that'll come to fruition here in the next, probably the next couple of months. Other see. Um, do you expect this plant to last about the same amount of time? So can we expect in 50 years or 30 years, or when would we be expected to build the next one? And is there a, a plan to start socking money away for that? The, the plant, <laughs> I mean, obviously this one has lasted for 50 years. Uh, the, the folks at the state consider 30 years a, uh, a workable range when you're looking to finance them. Um, it's hard to put a number on it, but using modern materials, modern technology, we would hope that it would have the same 30, 40, 50 year life. Uh, and no, at this point in the budget, um, there is not a, uh, a plan. Uh, quite honestly, there should be. And I would hope that uh, new manager and uh, select board in ensuing years would begin a, a small uh, process of putting money away each year. Any other? I have just a really quick question. Oh, where, are we in the life cycle right of the, where are we in the life cycle of the Woodstock plant, for example? Uh, as we indicated earlier today, um, the current budget uh, for the wastewater, uh, the current wastewater budget has $35,000 in it to do some preliminary engineering to do an assessment on the existing plan. Uh, somewhere in the next, oh, probably two to five years, uh, you are going to have to address uh, some upgrades to that plan. Any other questions? Yes, Wendy. Forgive me if this is a plain catch-up question. Our recent sewer bills went up significantly from last year, or at least mine did. I don't know if that's a, a shared experience, but I am seeing our sewer bills go up. Uh, this is a significant increase on top of a very recent increase on an individual household's sewer bill. So my question, is that not true? No, I, I, I believe it is. It is true. Um, I had the same experience. We all have the same experience. It, it, it's been a big jump. Um, this will add to another, and make yet another big jump. That's the fact. That's a fact. Uh, we don't have a choice. We have to pay the processing. Are there any other questions, comments on Article 14? If not, we will move on to Article 15. Uh, Peter? All right, so we've got two significant loose ends that we've, that we've left here so far. One is 
if, if we're going to make improvements to the tennis courts, uh, it sounded like we were victims of somebody else's scheduling. It, who's going to be the person responsible on this board in front of us who's going to make sure that uh, things are done in as, in as short a period of time as possible? But we need some one person to be accountable to that. That's one loose end. And the other loose end was this thing about if there's this um, cycling of the recycle plant, the waste sewage plant, that we have to anticipate, then it also makes sense that we budget in, uh, uh, start putting money aside for it rather than waiting till the last minute and going, ah, we've got $3 million additional expense this year. So those are the two loose ends. Could those be addressed? Well, the, the select board is the board of sewer commissioners. Well, who's the person? The, the entire select board is legally the board of sewer commissioners as well. Oh. So Part who of would your you job. call? Who would you call and say how we're doing? Don't call me. <laughs> okay. I actually, call the manager. The, the, the manager works for the select board, and, and uh, he's he's the person that will be the point person on all of this. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on Article 14? All right, Article 15. Shall general obligation bonds or notes of the town of Woodstock in an amount not to exceed $4,500,000, subject to reduction from the receipt of available state and federal grants and aid and other financial assistance, be issued for the purpose of financing the cost of renovating and reconstructing the town emergency services building, the estimated cost of such improvements being $4,500,000. Anyone want to speak? We Again, we had a hearing about this before our meeting this morning. Matt, I'll, I'll Butch? Start. Um, so we had, a very good we had a very good presentation this morning. Getting tired here. It's on. It's on. It's on. We had a very good presentation this morning um, by the chief on this proposal. Um, so I would say that if you have any further questions or any new ideas, um, you should address them to him. But I will say that this is a, um, a project that has gotten an awful lot of thought from a building committee uh, to do what we were gonna do. The original proposal, uh, the original idea was to totally demolish that building and build a brand new building, which would have been six million plus. And uh, the committee realized that that was not what Woodstock voters needed to hear. So they worked very hard to save the old building uh, and build th what was needed for the department for the next 30 to 50 years. So uh, I'd just like to add that to it. Thank you. Yes, right over here, Matt. Oh, and then we'll get down, come back down for My name's Deb Hawthorne. Um, forgive me if this is repetitive. Um, Mary mentioned something about this, and so maybe it was, came up while I was at lunch. Can't hear you. Yep, no, just, just hold it close, Deb. I think it's on. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry if I'm repeating, but Mary mentioned something about this, and so maybe it was um, brought up while I was at lunch. But I'd like to reference Peter Bowen's letter um, about this uh, that appeared in this week's issue of the Standard regarding the lack of net zero emissions provisions in this plan. Um, and I'm wondering where we stand with that, um, given all the other work that we're doing on so many fronts. Um, on carbon emissions and reducing energy usage and energy emissions, um, it seems important to include that in the plan for this building. It, it was discussed at the, the hearing this morning. At the hearing this morning? Okay. Yes. I miss that. So where does it stand? I think it stands that we've heard you and we'll do everything possible. It seemed to me today from listening to the conversation this morning that some people in this room that have some good ideas and are knowledgeable in this field. And I think the chief will more than reach out to them. So the plan will be reconsidered, in other words? 
we'll do the best we very can to uh, make it sure that it's the most energy, brand new energy efficiency building in Woodstock. Thank you. Uh, right down front. Um, I'm going to talk about this article and the, the article following um, because, and kind of the general picture of emergency services in Woodstock. Um, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this and all of the thought that's gone into it. Personally, and I know we're not making a decision about this here, but I think this is a premature to take on a significant amount of debt and to almost double the ambulance service budget before we've really taken a long, hard look and stepped back a little bit and looked at all of our emergency services and how are we most efficiently using them? Are there opportunities to regionalize some of these emergency services? Are we locking ourselves into a situation in which we're building a building that may not be meeting the needs of 30 years from now, it may not be meeting the needs of 10 years from now. Emergency services are a huge part of this budget. There's ex hundreds of thousands for the police, hundreds of thousands for dispatch, hundreds of thousands for the fire department. Obviously we need all of these things, but I s my, my question is have we seriously stood back, looked at the entire emergency services picture of this town and figured out the most efficient way to go forward and the most cost effective way to go forward and get the services we need. And I know that, and again, I appreciate the work that's been done on this. I'm not, I'm not, it, it's obviously, obviously everybody has, has put a lot of thought into this and I just wonder if, if it's not time to step back a little bit and think about how are we going forward with emergency services in this town and the tremendous amount of money they cost. I, I would point out that ambulance budget, you have to look at the revenue side as well. Yeah, but the revenue side yeah. doesn't amount to very much. Uh, yeah. I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm saying it's not, it's not just what you're spending. There is a revenue side to that as well. Can we... Uh, Go ahead, Butch. Uh, I think, are we going to discuss the ambulance or are we going to discuss this article? It, you know, we can... You want to There's some overflow. Okay. I, mean, we discuss, I, I think we're not uh, voting on either of these, and they're yeah, they're okay. right next to each other. So if there's no objection, I, I, I think kind of they kind of bleed together. David. So to answer your question, we've uh, started this process with Phil uh, a little over a year and a half ago, and one of our big discussions was what does our town need for emergency services? Currently, we obviously have police, fire, and EMS. Uh, so we looked at that, looked at our building, looked at what we expected our needs to be in the next coming 10, 20, 50, 60 years. Since then, we've received and we have worked with many other towns looking at regionalization. We're not there yet. We're there at the table with other towns discussing this. Currently, we provide EMS service for other towns. There are towns that have recently contacted me to take over fire services. There are towns that are now contracting with other ambulance services that are looking to see what happens here and wants to know our prices moving forward should all this pass. Um, I can't speak to police, whether there's any regionalization there because state police affect, you know, does their thing. Communications is a big one. State police wants to drop communications to fire and ambulance <coughs> service. We're looking at, with other towns, the infrastructure needs to take those over, which will be a cost savings to all towns, and especially to our town. So to answer your question, yes, we are looking. We're talking to other towns. We really can't give them numbers until we know whether this stuff passes and we can move forward and give them the price cost sharing of doing all that. So just so you know, we are looking at every revenue source out there to dig into the weeds a little bit more. Should the ambulance service pass? Right now we don't do non-emergency transports because we don't have the people to do that. That's gonna be one of the first things we look at because there is a huge amount of dollars that we're leaving on the table because, I don't know if you notice, but you see Golden Cross, you see Windsor Ambulance in our town every week doing non-emergency transports. We don't do that. 
There's money for that. So we're looking at every cost savings initiative that we can find to make this fair and equitable to the taxpayers, for people who use our services, and to other towns who may join our services. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. I mean, it does answer my question, and I appreciate that you're thinking about all of these things and going forward, but in the meantime, we're being asked to approve four and a half million dollar loan for a building that we don't know if that building is going to meet the needs that you're talking about. You're talking about a lot of interesting new initiatives, and I appreciate that. Is this building the right building for that? Yes, we believe so from the work we've done. We have the room to expand. One of the comments I often got is, why do you have eight beds in there, a room for eight beds? In the future, we expect, whether it's 10 years, 20 now, 20 years, 30 years, that you may have those number of people you know, sleeping overnight because of regionalization. So we've done that. We have the communication and data areas. We've looked at all this, so. Yeah, Susie. Um, so, Regionalization to me sounds like other towns would also be chipping into that $4 million and not just paying for a service. Like when, when you talk about, you know, driving people non-emergency services, that to me sounds like a user fee, not really regionalization means, you know, chipping in. I mean, I came, this morning when I woke up, I was determined to support this, this uh, um, article. But after Allison stood up and said that the state is looking at regionalization and doing experiments with that, it just seems to me like, well, maybe we should wait a year and see what comes out of that. Because regionalization to me means the $4 million. We're not the only town paying for that. All the, all the other stuff that you're talking about, like the, you know, the, the ambulance service, that sounds like user fees to me. Yeah, and a per capita fee was how that regionalization I envisioned would work. So it essentially will be a user fee. What that fee will be, I don't know right now. So you're saying it would make up the four million dollars? Like well, no, we would own the asset, obviously, but we would offset the cost to other towns through a per capita fee. Uh, Jason? So, thanks, David, for your work on this today. Sure. Um, one question was based on the 14,000 square feet, which I learned about in the information meeting. Cost is about $321 per square foot all in. How does that compare to other facilities, similar EMS buildings, either in the state or outside the state? How's that benchmark? Uh, I don't know about outside the state, but uh, within the state, we're right on the mark. Killington is doing one. Uh, Bridgewater is doing one. So you look at. The, we're doing an addition and a renovation. <clears throat> so it's a little tough to compare the two, but we're all right in there in the same cost per foot. And so I think earlier you answered a question. In the addition, in the back of the building is the new addition. On the drawing, it shows four fire trucks in that back, in addition to the fire trucks in the front of the building. Um, and I asked, I think, the question, we have those fire trucks in our stock right now Correct. And they're parked where? So most of them are parked down to the main station. There's one fire truck and one ambulance in Westwood stock. But if they're parked at the main station, they're outside? Nope. So in the plans, you'll notice where the two police cruisers were parked. Yes. So those were originally fire bays. The police don't park anywhere there. So we lose those two bays for... Um, working space and for right. the police to be indoors, and that's the reason we get the two bays in the back. Right, so it's substitution. You get, we, get, we get coverage for our cruisers, and the fire trucks then go in the back. Yes. Well, yeah. it's not only coverage for the cruisers, it's working gear, storage for medical equipment. There's a lot of things that we're lacking right now uh, that it gets added into that space. Right. So it seems like the design sort of presupposes that the f next article will pass because there were eight full-timers in that, in the ambulance. Uh, so it seems like it was kind of designed kind of to work with that um, article. And it, it, so if that article doesn't pass, we have overcapacity. That we could, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm just saying we, we have overcapacity. If the, if the EMS building passes, but the ambulance does not, then we have a building that we don't need today, 
what we may need in the future. Yeah, so we actually need that building today. Right now we rent housing. Um, it's not very attractive. Some of our out-of-town people, um, and to let you know that we only have 14 ambulance members, all right, to run coverage. Seven of those don't even live out in this town. They work, um, or live out of town, work here at night. We rent a uh, apartment, put them up in it. Some of them won't even stay in it because it has no amenities, no cable, no Wi-Fi, no nothing. They're putting themselves up. Um, so we actually need this building right now. And also, co-ed, they feel very uncomfortable putting a boy and a girl in the same building with no supervision. Um, so yeah, there's a definite need for it. So wh one question is, can we phase, so we go from 12 volunteers to eight full-timers. Can we, f is, there a, is there an alternative phased <coughs> strategy? Because I think that while I'm in support of this and there's a definite need, um, putting this in the context of everything else that's coming down the pike, we don't know what that main wastewater treatment facility is going to cost, and whether it's two years or five years. So, kind of the, the aggregate picture is really important. Is there is there a um, is there a plan B? In other words, can we go go to six, four and a half, four full timers, and then go to eight if we need them, or well, is it kind of black or white? Yeah, I, I'd like to say there is. Um, right now, our plan B, should this not pass, is we run as usual. Um, until we can. So what that means is we do a lot of extra events, GMHA, hockey, games, et cetera, and you talk about economic development, but we stop doing those, which means they can't work. They can't have the events. They can't um, have hockey games without us there. So, and then if you have an emergency run at the same time, um, and we don't have anybody, you're waiting 35 to 40 minutes for Hartford, maybe Rutland, maybe Lebanon, we don't know, because they're overworked as well. So our plan B is just to continue as we are until we can. And go immediately to eight. There's no in between. No, there really is, because we're losing members fast because of the requirement to even become an EMT, to continue your EMT license. Uh, we're, we're really at a breaking point. Who is on the building committee for that? Just I guess. So it's myself, Ingrid Nichols, Phil Swanson, um, Butch. Am I missing anybody, Butch? Uh, oh, Lisa Linton, um, Robbie. Robbie. And anyone on the pl from the planning commission? No. Um, okay. Thank you. has a question in the back. Just. I'm Shari White, and I have worked on Woodstock Ambulance for almost 30 years. I just want to support David, thank him for the presentation and the work that he's done, and invite anybody who has not gone down and toured our building to please do. Half our rooms are missing half the ceilings um, because of constant work that needs to be done. It's our ambulance. We have an office that is measured, what, five feet by six? for two people to work in. Um, we don't have safe keeping for medications. Um, we have very little space for our equipment. It's not a pleasant place when we have to do any work. Um, we have spent a lot of time training. But the other thing I wanna say is, um, as far as bringing on the eight full-timers, um, some of us are getting tired. We, I, for instance, on, on call Thursday nights, I got to bed at five o'clock Friday morning. By the time I got home, 5.30, my phone rang asking if I was available to work Friday during the day because we had people out sick. I have three other jobs that I work. Um, and at 6.15, the tone went off and there was a call for two ambulances at one house. Um, so numbers are needed. We had to bring in somebody who was sick to cover that call, and somebody from Heartland. The other thing to remember is, and I don't think it's been mentioned in, in this meeting, but we cover five towns, basically. We respond to Pomfret, Bridgewater, Woodstock, parts of Heartland, way out in Plymouth, um, South Woodstock. So our circumference is quite large. Um, those towns have fast squads that are running basically one member right now. 
So if, or nobody during the day. So those towns are being really underserved big time. Bringing on full timers would allow for coverage. I've run nights where I'm the only one on my crew. We have crews of two people. That means if I have to be out of town or my partner is sick, I'm alone. You can't run a call with one person. I had to call in Hartford to come pick my patient up. When the ambulance goes out, our procedure is we respond to the call and dispatch gives out a call for station coverage. Because so many of our people live out of town, those people are not available to step up and do coverage while we're transporting to Dartmouth. Um, the numbers, if you look at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just don't work. We need these people. Is it going to, are you going to phase us out? No. We're gonna bring, according to my conversation with David, and correct me David if I get this wrong, these people will come in, we'll have availability. We won't have to bring Hartford in, who's gonna charge you a lot more for that ride to Dartmouth than we do, and we will be the backup people. With our, what did I think, David, you said 10% of the time, we have two ambulances out at once. When Irene hit, I spent three weeks straight at the station. We had, I think, five times the normal number of calls the first week. We had three ambulances out the entire time. There were four of us down, or five of us down there covering all this. Um, and we were doing other things also. We were feeding firefighters. We were making sure seniors had meds and things like that. So we're not just there waiting for you to fall down or get sick or whatever. We are trained in other aspects of emergency services. Um, some of us are getting old, <laughs> gray hair. Some of us are starting to phase out. And as David wrote in his report, people are going to EMT classes that the town is paying, I believe, for them to go. And then they're getting halfway through the class and going, this isn't for me. I don't do blood or I can't give that commitment. The young people don't understand volunteering for their community. And we aren't seeing the young bodies come up through. It's not a matter of replacing us older people with young people. They just aren't coming along. And the reality is volunteerism is dying. We need paid personnel. If you want coverage, I mean, I, when I go on duty on Thursday night at six o'clock, it's like I've walked into my office. I've got a job. I'm up on a snowy night. I'm up every two hours cleaning my car off in case I have to go. I don't have a garage. So if I wanted to go stay at the station that night, that's a bonus to me. That saves me or allows me at least to get a little bit of sleep and if I don't get called out and then do my job during the day, my normal job, whatever, which one that may be. Um, so there's a lot of, you should talk to some of the ambulance people before making a decision is my feeling. We've all worked under some really interesting conditions. And I think it was a couple of years ago I stated that we used to do 48 hour weekend shifts. To me, like I said, when I go on duty, it's like my walking into my office. I am at my job. We were making, I calculated it was making 57 cents an hour. Thank you to David. We've finally seen a couple increases for the first time in 20 years. We don't get automatic increases like all the other departments do. This was the first time we've seen an increase in 20 years in our pay and a little bit of restructuring to our pay. And I thank him for that. He went to bat for us. We don't, we don't do this for the money, but it is a job for us. We spend hours every month training. We have to go to an annual conference to get our continuing ed um, credits. We have to research every two years. Um, we don't take it lightly. We're training constantly. Um, as David mentioned, we do a lot of outside work. I spend I think I spend 24 days of my summer working at GMHA, covering their events out there. 
And I do the roller derbies. I work all of those. I work football games. I work parades. Um, the, the Special Olympics when they used to be in town here. I work that as the EMT and so forth. Um, so it's beyond just responding to our calls. And if GMHA, having, I used to run GMHA, so I can vouch for this. If they don't have an ambulance or EMT, and at times a paramedic and EMT on call or on the grounds, they, per the American Horse Show Association, they cannot run their event. And you have to remember, they run almost 65 to 70 events a year. And for every horse that steps foot on that property, at least two people come with it. That's, and they don't allow camping, so that's a hotel. They're eating in our restaurants. It's huge for the town of Woodstock. If you start shutting down what they can do, because they, can't, they cannot run without us. Um, anyways, it, it impacts other things. Thanks. So, so sorry to be long-winded. I'd I just like to respond a second to, it's, it's important, I think, when we look at our community and we talk about all these other things that we want to do in our community to make people want to come here with their families and go to school and settle here. We need good schools, we need all of that stuff. People who look at our community also look at what do they have for a fire department, what do they have for emergency response. If you come from a town where you had a full-time ambulance and you come here and you have to work 35, 40 minutes for an ambulance to come from Hartford, yeah. you're probably not going to move to Woodstock. So it's just as important as all the other things that I hear discussed that it's important we do this and we do that because it's, it makes Woodstock a better place to live. And the yes. other, the other and, thing to remember is we have an, and, we have and, an aging community. And, and I'd like, Jill, Jill has a comment that I think is important for you to hear. Sherry, um, we've heard an awful lot about numbers today, but you're the person that makes this community work and I want to say thank you to you. You're welcome. Thank I you. Enjoy it. I think uh, Mary McVeigh, had a, Matt, just in front of you, Mary McVeigh is going to comment and then we'll come down. You sure? Okay. Sure? Yeah, positive. Hi, David, if I could ask you please to go back to Article 15 for a minute. I have a quick question. I think I heard in passing this morning in the discussion about the uh, renovation of the emergency services building that therefore the Westwood stock uh, emergency building would be closed. Is that a financial consequence of consolidating or is that because it's been determined that the service area is primarily located uh, more conveniently, more closely? The, the greater number of calls come from the, the eastern side of the town. Well, I, I wish there was an easy answer to that, but there's multiple things going on in that building. When that building was built, that West Woodstock was full of uh, local employees, I being one. And we could get that truck out of that house within three minutes and have people stand, and go, go, stand around going, darn, I missed that truck. Today, that truck leaves with one person after 15 minutes. So we are very close to shutting that down. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can keep it running, that we have more activity. I see a room full of people, I'm sure, that would love to become volunteers uh, for either fire or EMT. Um, so I'm hoping after this meeting we have an influx of people uh, looking to volunteer for that, our open positions. And when, we can keep that station running. When, when we built that building and took it over for, and renovated from the old school, uh, I worked very closely with Phil, and we kept it in, in mind that someday this probably wouldn't be used as effectively as it was when we did it. And we put, took a lot of time to put into it, so what could it be used for in the future if we didn't use it for a fire station? And so the building is ours. It's a good building for a lot of other uses that we may have. But if we don't have any firefighters out there or any ambulance people living out there, it's, it really is useless to us. Could be. Yes, Susie. And so, David said earlier today that he'll be available on Monday at the fire station for anyone who hasn't had an opportunity 
to tour the building and see the facility. Susie. So Dave, um, just to make sure I understand this, <coughs> excuse me, um, if we don't vote for the four point something million dollars to build a new building, we can't hire eight um, new people? I mean, can we hire the eight people per permanent and not build a building or what's? Yep, so we can, uh, if the building doesn't move forward and the EMS service does, we uh, can hire them obviously. But then it be pro becomes a problem of legally housing them. Once you employ somebody, you have to follow all federal and state guidelines. So practically any building requires a sprinkler now, requires a fire alarm. If we were to hire full-time EMT people and house them, do you really want to wait, them, wait for them to drive down to the fire station, grab an ambulance, and then head out? Because now we're right back to a service we previously had almost with a delay. Um, while we will do that, it doesn't seem very um, wise to me. So yes, no matter which either way passes, we can survive one without the other. But there are a couple of comments that I do want to ma make. Um, and, and while I don't want to gloom and doom, we're kind of in the same position with the sewer plant. OSHA visited us this summer and gave us a long list of violations. And I said, whoa, don't find us. Hold on, we're looking at a new building, give us some time. And some of these violations are very significant and they were touched on uh, in some cases on that PowerPoint. So they'll be back this summer if we don't pass um, looking for these corrections immediately because we house employees in there 24 hours a day, dispatchers and cops and stuff. Uh, another thing, somebody was talking about regionalization. Well, four years ago we had an ISO audit. So what that is, is that's the insurance rating from the town, for the town. We were a 6, 6X. We dropped to a 7, 7X. Within s uh, three quarters of a year, I re received several angry phone calls. People's insurance, specifically downtown, went up $600 a half a year. With the full-time fire, or ambulance people, which will be cross tain as firefighters, I'm gonna to work to get those points back. With the volunteer staff, I don't have the time, we just don't have the personnel to do it. So there's another cost saving, it's not in your budget, but it's actually in your pocketbook for people who own buildings downtown, and we see empty storefronts. This has a real Im impact on those buildings if we can gain those ISO points ratings. Th there's a lot tied to this. Um, I mean, your decision is yours. I've given you the facts. I don't think anybody doubts that the building's not in good shape, right? I, I don't really need to go through a list of what's wrong with it, what it, what it needs. It's just where do we put it in your priorities? And uh, I can't make that decision for you. It's up to you guys. As far as me with public safety, I, I know what I prefer. Take the other, I can't get too deep into it, but the three months ago we had a CPR. All right, got a call for a CPR. We got there, I happened to be there as well. We were there within five minutes. We shocked that gentleman 10 times. We did CPR on him for 45 minutes en route to the hospital. That guy walked out a week later, all right? Two weeks later, there was a CPR call in Southwood stock. We had nobody in town. They had to wait for a Hartford ambulance. Because of HIPAA laws, I don't know the outcome but I can't imagine it was that great waiting for an ambulance for 35 minutes while one of your loved ones is doing CPR. So that's some of the things you have to think about. I get that we live in a rural area, and this is one of the consequences of living in a rural area, that we may wait forever for EMS, police, fire, but you know, if we're looking to attract people, we're looking to attract young people. To me, this is one of the highlights of the community. Yes, go Kim. ahead. Kim had a question. Hi, we'll Dave. So here. I worked as a nurse manager at the VA, and I know one of the things that we struggled with was places like Golden Cross not being available anymore because they have a dwindling workforce also. So I'm just wondering, if we go to eight EMS full time, I, I had talked to Michelle back then when we were struggling to get patients out of the VA by ambulance, and she said you guys couldn't support it then. If we go to eight EMS, full-time, would we be able to support a contract like that, which may then 
eventually in the future pay for some like new ambulances, new equipment, that kind of big contract? Yeah, this is something we're really going to look long and hard at. Originally, we're going to look at doing only inter facility transports or, or transports to the hospital for Woodstock only people. Try small, see what it takes. We've never done it before and expand as funds and you know needs arise. So absolutely, we're going to be looking forward to that. Yeah, there is big money in that. All right, Any, uh, Peter had a question. It's so many of these issues we're talking about the expense side of things and worrying about that and worrying about the expense side of things. Let me just let me just speak to the benefit side of what we're talking about here. Um, I should have been dead 40 years ago and would have been if the community where I where I ran my motorcycle into somebody's car. Oops. Uh, uh, and broke all my bones and my body ended up in upside down, face down in a swamp. If that community hadn't made the decision in a room like this to go ahead with emergency services and those people wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been there within just a few minutes of the horrible accident that I caused and I'm here today, you know, whether, for which I'm grateful, that's one. But so are my, I think, five children and my wife and what I have contributed to the community also, I mean, there are all kinds of benefits that come out of the kind of thing, the expense that we're struggling with right here. But I want to speak to that. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, or Michael, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And then Emo, you had something? Yeah, oh. David, I appreciate all of your sharing and taking the time to talk to us about all this. And I'm, I'm conflicted in a number of ways just because you know, I grew up with um, nurses in my house. My mother was a registered nurse for 40 years. And I worked in a hospital for five years, including helping out in the emergency room for a time. So I've seen the other end of um, where your experience, all of your experiences with coming in with people who have had accidents and been in fires and other things. So my heart is, and, and mind are drawn towards doing everything to support what you're doing. And I also have the, the part of me that is, and I know other people in this room and community do as well. It's kind of ironic that we're facing, uh, maybe not ironic in these times, but we're facing replacement of the emergency service building in the same uh, time period that the select board and trustees just passed a climate emergency in action resolution. So there's the other piece of it, which is that the, you know, the planet is on life support as well. So I'm just trying to work through my mind how we can you know, get from, if we were able to get the building towards net zero in a reasonable future, we could, after about seven years, see a financial benefit. And if the life of the building is 30 to 50 years, significant savings, thinking strategically, economically, so getting the benefit of the emergency services that we need, while also saving the town a huge amount of money and doing a tremendous amount of good for the planet, how do we get there from here? I'm not sure with the, with the, warranted, um, the warrant that we're facing and discussing right now, how can we move it in that direction? Is there a commitment to move it that in that direction so that both emergencies are, are being addressed at the same time? I just wanted to put that out there and then also say that Sustainable Woodstock and the Energy uh, Action Committee um, and our volunteers would, would do what, everything we could to help get um, this building to that place. With the current design, how do we how do we do that? I just wanted to put that question out there and see wh where that could go, given where we are right now with the with the article and uh, the plans. So, so you're asking for a response on the net zero again? Yeah. Yeah. We're we're gonna we'll, we'll meet with some key people. I think we've uh, heard some um, people who are well knowledge in that and uh, see what we can do. Uh, obviously, any initiative moving forward on the 4.5 is going to be effective. Uh, uh, so 
we'll do what we can, see what we can maybe, you know, we're planning for solar panels on the roof. When, I don't know, but we're making sure the roof structure can hold it. We're looking at, at the highest grade uh, R value uh, insulation. So we'll do all can, we can and keep moving forward. Yeah, uh, we're starting to get into the weeds a little bit. It's a discussion that should be had down, down at the fire station, I, I believe, just in the interest of time. Um, I think if people are comfortable that we've covered Article 15 and 16 kind of together. Can I just um, add yes, David. one little thing? So off the cuff, just quickly, I went to one of our fine establishments the, establishments the other night, had dinner, brought two close friends, so there was four of us. That was more expensive than the cost for a $200,000 house for both the fire station and the full-time ambulance service. All right, so just keep that in mind. Uh, the second is, the second is uh, Woodstock Fire is celebrating 200 years. This April 3rd, we have the Fireman's Ball. There's gonna be a lot of history, a lot of fun, some great bands. Uh, so I would love to see you all there. Tickets are online, or you can come down to the fire station or see any firefighter. Laird, right. you had something? Yeah. It is fancy dress. Yeah. What, what's the name of that old fire truck you have? Maxim. Maxim. Oh, yeah. That's a great name. <laughs> Spelled differently. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it, is, is it 53 years old, too? Or? Uh, no, that's old. 1923. You know, we've be, we've been kind of focusing on math quite a bit, and you know, cost-benefit analysis and all of that. Quite simply, with a population of 3,000 people, when you do the math and you divide it into 4.5, you're looking at about $1,500 per person. And I'm not sure about you, but I certainly value the folks in my family uh, somewhat above that particular number. One of the things in my business <clears throat> that I get a chance to see very quickly is just how people make decisions and what their decision trees are all about. Kind of why they decide to choose Woodstock over, let's say, Norwich and Hanover or some other community. And, you know, very high up on those list of people are schools, health, safety, and kind of the general feeling of the community and its cooperation and connectedness. And, uh, you know, I think this kind of hits all those particular bases very well. Thanks, sir. It's a good proposal. One thing I do want to guarantee is no matter what happens Tuesday, I hope you vote. And we will be there Wednesday morning doing what we always do. We won't stop doing it until we run out of people. So this isn't a scare tactic or anything that the service isn't going to stop Wednesday morning. But we do need drastic help. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we really have to keep I know. moving along. Just one more quick, quick comment, Matt. I just want to thank David for all that he's put into this. And the other thing to mention about David is be, just because you don't see a fire truck going through town, I've never known somebody who responds 24-7 to anybody who calls in with a battery in their smoke detector. He's on it. He's there. It doesn't always get toned out but I hear it on the radio that he's gone to that person's house and checked it out. How he gets to scene first, I think he's got, either sleeps in his truck or he has wings on his truck. I don't know how he does it, but he's amazing. I hope he'll give him his, the support that he's worked on this um, and we, we owe him a lot. Thank you. So well, I appreciate that. Uh, I love my town. With all of our courts, I love living here. I love the people. And I'm not looking for anybody. I'll help anybody 24-7. That's what I'm here for. And that will never happen. All right. So before we move into um, these next few articles, I know there are folks here to speak on behalf of these organizations. I'm just going to ask for about a five-minute recess. The people up on this stage can't even step out to the bathroom or anything. We need to stretch our legs for a few minutes. And um, we'll try to reconvene within five to 10 minutes. I'll try. I encourage people to be concise. 
Um, is there anyone who wants to speak on Article 17 for Green Mountain RSVP? Seeing none. Um, Article 18, um, Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services. Is there anybody here who wants to speak on behalf of that article? No. Article 19, um, the 51,250 for the Norman Williams Public Library. I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to talk, but they've all gone. Okay. <laughs> so, so you all know it's been a rough year for the library. We did go for a lot of private, private right. funding. We got it. So we saved an awful lot. Um, and the HVAC is well on its way to be repaired. But we still are desperate for funds for operating costs. As you know, we raise most of our money. <laughs> Not most, we still get a lot from Woodstock and we're very, very grateful for it. But we still need this um, amount that we petitioned for. It's absolutely a key part of our budget just to keep keep going. Not to increase anything, but just to keep level. Any questions about that? Sorry, wasn't prepared. Wasn't supposed to be my job. Uh, the Adequity Health Foundation. Somebody wants to speak for oh, there we go. So I'm Jennifer Baxter. I'm a newly appointed board member to the Ottaquichi Health Foundation. Just want to thank everybody for support um, for the petition to be uh, to have thirty thousand. Thank you. I do have some stats here, but I know everyone's anxious to move on, so I will pass that. Thanks. Isn't there a movie starting in a few minutes? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Matt, that was a great segue because our next article is Pentangle. <laughs> They're not even here. It's, Alita's out there somewhere. Yeah, Alita's coming right in. I, I think I surprised some people out there by being so quick, but. Well, we're at it. Yes. I I could support the arts during these dismal times that we are in and say that I think sometimes we forget that that might be the most important thing to support. <laughs> wow, you guys move fast. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, connecting with family. I'll be very brief. I'm Alita, you all know me. Um, welcome to your town hall. I hope you've noticed some of the improvements we've made. We raised uh, a matching grant to do the carpet, resurface the stage, redid the concession area, and the green rooms have all been upgraded. Um, we'd like to thank donors, voters, and the EDC for making uh, Pentangle possible and for enabling us to keep the doors open for 52 screenings of films every year. Uh, we had over 19,000 people come through the venue, so we hope that we are enhancing the cultural and economic vitality of our town. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alita. And Article 22, um, Senior Solutions. Is there somebody here who wanted to speak? See none. Article 23, Sevka. Is there some, oh, right behind you, Matt. Thank you very much for your patience and stamina. This is quite an amazing town, an amazing set of citizens in the town. Um, my name is Steve Geller. I'm the executive director of SEVCA, which stands for Southeastern Vermont Community Action. We are the designated anti-poverty agency for Wyndham and Windsor counties by the uh, state and federal governments. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, uh, the, the town of uh, Woodstock for the many years of support um, you've given us to help us provide the services we provide to residents of this town and, and uh, those all over the county. Um, and for allowing me to speak to you today, uh, especially this late in the day. Um, we, um, we pr I won't bore you with the details of all the services we provide. It's on page 111 in the town report. I urge you to look at it and see the range and uh, quantity of services we provide. I will just point out, in light of all of the discussions you've had today about energy efficiency, that our biggest program is our weatherization and heating system repair and replacement program. Uh, and we've uh, run that program for over 40 years, provided um, just over the last five years, um, we've weatherized 
and provided heating system work to um, 53 homes in Woodstock with 119 residents um, and helped them tremendously to reduce their energy costs and reduce the carbon footprint uh, uh, in this town. Um, but we have many other services to help people cope with the hardships of poverty, uh, stabilize their lives, and work their way up towards self-sufficiency. Uh, and a whole range of them, some of which we provided to the residents of the town last year. Others uh, were not uh, asked for in the town, but we provided them to many, many uh, residents in many communities throughout our service area. Um, I'll give you a sense of what the value of uh, the, the, your contribution is um, to, uh, to our ability to provide these services. For every dollar, over the la for last year, every dollar you provided, um, provided a return on investment of $11.40 worth of services delivered to the town. Over the last five years, um, every dollar um, produced a return on investment of $23 worth of services to people in Woodstock. Uh, and in addition, um, <clears throat> the, the, the value of um, the contributions that the residents of Woodstock and all the towns we serve make is that they're flexible funding so that we get many, many, they're a small proportion of our total funds, but the vast majority of the funds we get from state and federal grants are very restricted to a certain purpose, to a certain way of doing things and the, the support we get from the, the communities in our service area uh, allow us to meet the needs of the people we serve on the ground where we see them and how we work with individuals to identify their needs and help them meet them and without the restrictions to say we can only give you this or, or we can only do it that way. So the, these are critical funds for us to provide services for things that the the standard categorical grants won't allow us to do. Uh, and um, that's all I think I need to say uh, today, but I thank you again for your support over many, many years, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Steve. Article 24, Spectrum Teen Center. Somebody want to speak about that? It's a good thing, we'll move on. Article 25. Uh, Public Health Council of the Upper Valley. Nobody here to speak about. Article 26, uh, Visiting Nurse and Hospice of Vermont and New Hampshire. Moving along, Article 20. Okay. Well, I'm not in the VNA anymore, but um, I've been here for about 50 years, so retired nurse. Yeah, maybe. Thank you. Mucho. <laughs> and uh, VNA goes into many homes in our community and all over, um, and also helping care providers that go in and help probably mainly our elderly client and patients who are debilitated in one way or the other. That's a great group. I, I don't think I have to push that too much. So okay. I certainly hope you will uh, su support. Thanks, Thank you. Um, uh, Windsor County Mentors. Yes, Lynn. Hi, I'm Lynn Morrell. I'm <clears throat> on the board of Windsor County Mentors and their current treasurer. Uh, a lot of you will know us as Windsor County Partners, which we've been for 46 years. And I'm not, not going to say much except just to point out that uh, uh, there are estimated to be 1,000 children in Windsor County who need a mentor. And our organization is currently serving 50 of those, which is doubling over the last year. We've recently received some funding which is allowing us to expand throughout the county and we're hoping to increase our mentorships here in, in Woodstock as well. And if none of you have ever considered the value of a mentor to a young person, uh, really think about it because it can change a person's, a kid's life. So I hope you'll support us. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Article 28, wise. Meg? Hi, I'm Meg, and um, WISE is a Women's Informational Service. It's, it's located in Lebanon, and um, they've been coming to our um, village for about 38 to 40 years. They help families, children, 
moms, dads with um, domestic abuse, family violence. Um, they've really increased their availability and types of services. Being a retired nurse at Dartmouth, they would come in and help doctors and nurse help the clients that we would receive related to domestic violence and abuse. And they probably already had them on their client list. So that too, they come to the schools, they work with the kids, uh, families, whoever fits into the category of need that they do provide. Please support. Thanks, right across to Beth. Hi the there. Chamber uh, of Commerce. I'm Beth Finlayson, I'm from the Woodstock area. Chamber of Commerce. And I just wanna follow up with Meg because WISE has been um, to the Welcome Center and we have information in both the men's room and the, the ladies' room. Um, and the information leaves there on a regular basis and we've had a whole variety of calls from people from really all over the country who've said, I think it's great that you have that information there for people to call. So um, the Woodstock Area Chamber of Commerce is, um, runs the Welcome Center. We saw over 48,000 people last year um, at that building. Um, and we do all kinds of other things, but we're asking for funding for managing and running the Welcome Center. We uh, meet people who want to move here, that have families that want to live here, uh, many tourists, uh, many locals. And um, above that, we do all kinds of other things in town, such as the flower baskets, not with this money, but um, flower baskets, the holiday lights, um, all of the events like Taste of Woodstock, and especially Wassel Weekend, which brings thousands of people and lots of recognition um, into our community. So thank you for your continued support. And uh, Deanna, I told you to be after lunch. <laughs> I'm Deanna us. Jones, and I'm the I'm from Pomfret, so I think I have to declare that. Yeah. But um, I'm very happy to be here, and I love the town of Woodstock and being the director of the Thompson Senior Center, which is what I'm here to tell you all about. <laughs> um, well, we served over 21,000 meals this year, which was a record. We're growing significantly every year, and I want you all to know. Um, you know, you've heard all day about the growth and the age of our population, but I think the Senior Center is probably one of your very best investments for preventative um, health, emotional and mental um, health prevention um, to reduce some of those other expenses. We have fall prevention programs. We give out medical equipment. We, if someone calls us on Christmas Eve looking for a walker, um, we deliver it. And we are, I think, a pretty big bang for your buck. Um, our article um, is also up for our tax exempt status, so I'll speak once if that's sure. okay. Um, we've been in our location in our building um, for almost 30 years now. It is, um, not as some other senior centers are in many areas of the state, um, a town department, we are independent. And so therefore we have to um, ask for that tax exempt status. Um, we are a, a very effective senior center um, and often recognized as one of the very best in Vermont and even in New England. And I'll just leave you with one um, statistic about that. Um, every year we compare our services and our reach to the census, and we're reaching more than 50% of the people 65 and older on our census, compared to 7% uh, reach of average senior centers in rural areas. So um, we're very effective at what we do. We're very appreciative and frugal with the way we use the funds, um, but we certainly couldn't do it without the, all of the town funding um, from our towns that we serve. So thank you very much. Thank you, Deanna. Um, somebody about the Woodstock Area Job Bank, Article 31. They do a great job of finding jobs for people. Article 32, 
Uh, the Woodstock History Center. Is there anyone in the room who might possibly <laughs> want to speak about the Woodstock History Center? I've been waiting for this all day. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. I'll be really brief. Uh, I'm Matt Powers. I'm the director at the Woodstock History Center, formerly known as the Woodstock Historical Society. Um, I've been here um, going almost eight years uh, at the History Center, um, but I've lived here for seven years. And what I can be certain of is that when I see people come to Woodstock, whether they're tourists, um, potentially moving here, moving here, um, I don't hear them say, oh my god, this is the best Cumberland Farms I've ever seen in the world, and that's why I came. Um, they come here because of the unique character of our village and our town. Um, that has a lot to do with historic resources, and that's the business that we're in. We try to um, save a lot of artifacts, and we also like to contribute lots of content, just like the picture of Phil on the top of the annual report, um, helping the fire department with their 200th anniversary, um, all that kind of stuff. And you know, early in the day when I saw this place was pretty full, I, I was really um, proud that I could look out and see a lot of faces that I've had personal conversations about and try to help or provide information to, um, because we get a lot of, a lot of requests. Um, going to our uh, appropriation, we are asking for help for energy efficiency. And that translates to insulating a 213-year-old building. We consider this uh, one of our artifacts. It's our largest artifact. Um, and it's a keystone property right here in the middle of the village. Um, it does two things. One, it helps uh, fulfill part of our strategic plan that the Board of Trustees um, outlined, which was better with energy efficiency and take care of our building and also create better access because we're open uh, short periods of time. And I'll tell you right now that 213-year-old building is not very well positioned to receive visitors right now. So that does position us to do that. And in dovetailing to that, if we can take care of that building, we're trying to put more long-term exhibits in that tell the story of Woodstock. And it sounds really simple and basic, but it's not. We're trying to really delve into not just Woodstock's the Shire town, blah, 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 blah. We're trying to really get to the heart of things because almost on a daily basis, we get people coming in and said, I just bought a house in town. I want to know everything about it. And that's great, but we have very finite resources. So we're um, asking for just a little help this year. Um, I will remind everyone that we haven't gotten an appropriation. Uh, we haven't asked for an appropriation since 2016. And I'm very proud of our Board of Trustees of making that decision because we understand that um, our taxes are whew, going right out of the roof. I'm a citizen and I saw that today. Um, so I'm, I'm on the other side of the fence looking back in and saying, yeah, sure, let's increase taxes through my organization. Um, but I can see the, uh, the absolute impact that what I do every day on all of the people that live here and come here. Um, so I'm really excited that, at least for this year, we'll come back and to say, we just need a little help. Um, I don't know if I can speak for the board and saying we'll be back next year. Um, I would probably bet that we won't um, if we can't help it, um, because we're going to try to reach out in the community as best way we can to, to <coughs> raise those funds without always asking for the town. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Shari? Matt, just two quick questions. Um, one is, will this uh, insulation or whatever you're doing allow you to be open more during the year? Yeah, absolutely. It does basically the Dana House basement. Um, there's absolutely no insulation in that basement. It's a single board. You would think after 213 years, someone would say insulation is a good thing. Um, so that's the first step to making it a little more livable. Um, and the exhibits that will go into there will last um, at least three to five years. Um, and we can receive more groups like Rose Scholar groups and things like that. Other question, quick question was, is this a... Um proposal, whatever, that you could go to the EDC for funding? Uh, do I want to talk about the EDC? Well, <laughs> just answer it like, you know, in 10 words or less. But um, not this year, the because they dispersed, um, their funds exceeded, um, at the time I was under the understanding that they were only um, going to receive grants of 5000 or more, and there might be some left. 
So we are um, we usually try a multifaceted fundraising approach of like budget money, reserve funds, grants, individual donors. Maybe if we have to come back the taxes. And so I was sort of anticipating doing that, um, and then things didn't happen that way. So as you subtract numbers, you have to go, okay, what's the best bang for the buck? And we thought long and hard about whether we were gonna come back to the town for this, um, because it does. It was a very meaningful conversation of not doing it. And so um, I really believe that the board and the staff really believe that this is the best bang for what we're planning on, because it was all very strategic. Our strategic plan is five years out. But it's very tangible things. It's not just like, we're going to be the best museum in the world. You know, it's this is what we do, and this is the big splash that it makes across our entire organization and for our community. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, Macy, do you want to say anything about WCTV 8? Sh sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I have, to, I have to get out in front here a little. Get, get out in front. Uh, my name is Macy Lawrence. I'm the executive director of WCTV. Uh, I've been doing this for 11 years now, believe it or not. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yes. Hello? Yeah. Um, it's been a lot of changes in the industry since I uh, joined the station. Uh, Back in the dim times, uh, we were producing probably about uh, five hours a week and running it three times a day in segments. And uh, now we're broadcasting uh, 24 hours a day and uh, with 18 hours of content uh, um, being run probably uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, we, uh, one of the changes that the, recently taken place is that are changing our channel from channel 8 to channel 1080. This is a result of uh, changes of agreement with the state and uh, with Comcast. So right now we're broadcasting on channel 8 and also on channel 1080. And uh, at the end of the month, in the March, I believe it is, that. Uh, you can only catch us on 1080. So uh, put that down on your calendars if you're a Comcast customer. Uh, we also broadcast uh, on our website, and uh, everything that we televise uh, for the cable goes on the website, and you can stream it, or you can watch it on YouTube or Facebook when we stream, stream live. Uh, we have just acquired a whole bunch of new streaming equipment, and so we should be doing it more regularly as time goes on, get used to the, to the equipment. I used to believe that uh, uh, what stayed in Washington uh, happens in Washington, stayed in Washington, but I've come to believe that that's not true, and most recently we found the uh, uh, TV station in the crosshairs of the FCC. Uh, the cable companies uh, under the pay and play, um, pay and play uh, regimen of the new administration uh, allowed them to petition uh, the FCC to uh, take away funding uh, that they ordinarily give us for the use of the public rights of way. Um, actually, that was taken away a long time ago, and, it, and it's now paid for by the subscribers. Uh, um, the cable companies don't pay for the use of the rights away, and they haven't done it in years. Uh, so, but what they're trying to do now is to backhaul some of that money, um, take it away from the station uh, by charging us for use of equipment and services that we used to get for free. It's also going to affect towns because uh, there's a lot of towns have uh, a component that uh, they get money from cable subscriptions. It's going to affect schools for uh, free television. They're going to be charged for it. Uh, libraries and so forth. So on no, uh, March 11th, there is a um, uh, case in uh, Ohio District Court, a federal case, to basically disallow um, 
of the FCC ruling. And if that passes, we'll be in good shape. And if it does, it will be in, in, in difficult conditions going forward. So your support of the town um, is critical to us going forward at this point. Basically, what's happened is we're going to be transitioned from being a quasi uh, government utility to being another local nonprofit. And what's at stake here is local coverage and of, of your events and uh, being able to um, uh, provide you with the right to know what's going on in your town. So your help is uh, very important to us at this time. Thanks so much. Our, our last ad article, Deanna touched on it, as long as everybody understands how the tax exemption works, I think we're good. I would entertain a motion to adjourn to Butch's house for cocktails. <laughs> Moved by Matt Power, seconded by Michael Ritchie. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. John, I think your ride's here. Macy, thank